so I'm, I'm not very good. So I asked my friend, Dickon Bob Taxi. Uh, he's a scientist. Uh, he has been traveling internationally. He's on an international platform to give talks in Switzerland and all of the places. He do a lot of research. He wrote a book on, on this subject. So uh, uh, I have to say that I invite him and I thank him for his generosity to come over and share with us uh, today. And this is very important. Uh, uh, Boss and science part one and part two. So if you would like to get Part two, part two, dealing with a lot more spirituality. Okay, so this one will give you a really a comprehensive uh, taste of science and how science and theology are really uh, are complementary. Huh? Right. And over to uh, the uh, Dickon Bob, and then uh, I come in and out with him. You know, but uh, he's the main speaker. He he leads from the from the world. Thank you, Father. Uh, it's an honor of being here. And it's wonderful to talk to Catechists because I can tell you, as you probably already you know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a loud mouth. I'm a loud mouth. Um, as you probably know already, the youth is leaving the church. And what I have found in this subject is there is a tremendous hunger from the youth to hear this because they think science is contradicting faith. Uh, and it isn't. In fact, there's a convergence taking place. It'll never converge completely because they answer different questions. So, uh, basically, there are two sections. There's the part one, which is this morning. And we're going to talk about revelation and principles to kind of set the groundwork. And this is kind of a summary of a graduate course that I taught at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, then we're going to go to physics to creation and then chemistry to life. And then we'll have questions and answers. Now, Sister Marie Gretti was concerned that she wanted to have your group also hear the second part. And uh, the second part is only going to be attended by 13 people or so. So what I'm going to do, I just got her permission, is to cut the questions and answers short and go right into part two. And I don't know how far I'll get, but we'll do our best. Uh, now, the reason I did it in this sequence is there is an overlap. Uh, there is a... Talking about the universe actually leads to prayer, and it's kind of a strange thing. You may not understand that, but we're going to go to biology and consciousness, psychology and mysticism, and we can make it through. Uh, basically, each section is going to be broken with a slide, so you know when I'm moving from one section to the next. Revelation. God reveals himself in three ways, through scripture, tradition, and nature. And quite often, we don't focus on nature. It is the oldest form of revelation there is. And I gave those dates just as rough dates of when the verbal tradition started, when Jesus' ministry started, etc. So we're going to focus on nature, and there are a lot of schools, even seminaries, that are not that are just starting to do this. Um, we're going to go on a basis of non-dualism, and that is very fundamental for our Catholic belief, that the faith and reason are meant to go hand in hand, body and soul, are meant to be interstitial and meant for each other, and God and man. And so that's a principle that is not followed by all faiths. For example, Buddhism believes in dualism. That's why they can kill their body under certain circumstances, because they're going to get another one. That's not our Catholic teaching. So faith and science agreement. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from false absolute. Same as called John Paul, should have put it in there. Science without religion is blind. Religion without science is blind. Einstein. Now, there are two extremes we want to avoid. Fundamentalism, which is literal interpretation of scripture. You run into fundamentalists. This is an extreme that we're not going to take. Scientism also has its extreme, and that is everything to be understood through science, which you will find out as we go along. Science doesn't even agree with that. There are different questions being answered. Faith is the why, science is the how. But they're complementary as we dance through. And I'm going to go through more of the science and then touch on the scripture. And I want you to kind of pull it together in your head as we go along. This is key. Miracles are not contrary to nature, but only contrary to what we know about nature. St. Augustine of Hippo. If you're like me when I was young, I thought that 
that a miracle was an exception to the laws of nature. That's kind of insulting to God. I mean, the, the miracle is here. This is the miracle. It's just that we don't know it and understand it completely. And so God's inviting us, as St. Augustine would, would have said here, he's inviting us to study the more detail. So, unfortunately, I'm going to try to stay away from math, but we're going to be dealing with big numbers. So, some of you may not be aware of this already, some of you may be, but the speed of light is critical, 186,000 miles per second. And a light year is the distance light travels in a year, or the... Uh, the 10 to the 12 actually means number 12 zeros after this. So you move it over 12 places, which has been done here, and that's 5.9 trillion miles, one light year, 5.9 trillion. Now, if this was a 10 to the minus 12, which you'll see some numbers like that, then it's zero, the, the decimal point would be moved over this way, making the number extremely small. So we're going to play a little a little imaginative game here. We're going to pretend we're outside the universe. I'm going to explain later that's a bizarre thought, why. But right now, we're going to pretend we're outside the universe and we've got a telephoto lens and we're zeroed in on Earth. And we're going to start backing up until we get to a wide angle lens to embrace the whole universe. That was Earth, okay? Now, if you look at the solar planets in our solar system, Earth has gotten quite a bit smaller. Now our solar system, if you add the sun, and uh, maybe we should turn the lights out of here. But, uh, can we turn them off? Great, thank you. Uh, maybe that helps. Uh, the Earth is here, see the little arrow? Minuscule, in our solar system, okay? Other stars. Now suddenly you don't even see Earth, you're just talking about our sun, which was already gigantic compared to these. These are 1,000 light years away, the 15th brightest, and 5.8 quadrillion miles. Immense, and we're still in our galaxy. Now there are other planets, but scientists don't know how many. Uh, can't, there, there's a guess, they think there are as many as 100 billion planets, it's possibly 17 billion, similar to Earth, in our galaxy. But we don't know. Inter-between galaxies, there are these interstellar nebula. This is the Eskimo Nebula, 5,000 light years away. Um, then there's the Milky Way that everybody, if you're out in the country, there's no city lights. You'll see stars all over the place. What you're really looking at is the tail of our galaxy. We are actually here. Our sun is here on the tail of our galaxy. Now, this is the Milky Way galaxy, and there's no way we could have gotten a photograph of that because we can't get outside and look in. But this is a rendition of what it is and how far across, 100,000 light years across, times 5.9 trillion miles. You get the whole of the sag side of this, okay? 200 billion stars in our galaxy. But there are other galaxies, not just ours. This is the Sombrero Galaxy. They get these names because of the way they look. This one is 28 billion light years away, 50,000 light years across, 800 billion stars. I want, to get you, I, want to, I want to get a feel for the magnitude because God is all. A W E. God is all. Now, this was the Hubble Ultra Deep Field test from the Hubble spacecraft. Now, if you held up a dime, a dime, to this night sky, you would see an area that big. Now, that looks like a lot of stars, right? Those are galaxies. Those are other galaxies. Just through a little dime at arm's length. So the visible universe that we just talked about has somewhere between 200 and 700 plus billion stars per galaxy. We have no idea what that is. People will try to say, well, our galaxy's average, that would be 200 billion, but we don't know. There are approximately 100 to 170 plus billion galaxies. 
Are you with me here? This is getting mind-blowing, okay? And that means, with a little math, that there's anywhere from 20 to 1,190 billion trillion stars. And you would eat this up, but the punchline hasn't come yet. What is the total universe? Well, what we just described, what we just described, all those galaxies, all those stars, is only 4% of the universe. We can only see 4% of the universe. The other is dark matter and dark energy. We can't see it. Are you getting, are we getting a sense of the magnitude here? Uh, it's it's mind-boggling. We know these exist because the effects they have on the visible matter. So there's ways of measuring this. And of course, the black hole at the center of our galaxy is a black hole that holds all the stuff in because it's creating gravitational force while the disk is spinning. It's like taking a, a rock on a, a string and spinning it. Okay, the string is the gravitation, and the the rock going out is the uh, is the uh, centrifugal force setting it out. So they got to be in balance. So. This is a faint red object in a massive galaxy, ten or greater than ten million light years away, and because of the uh, the light here, this is actually an, an enlargement of a little square, <coughs> a little square, and it has been enlarged. We're looking at this galaxy as it existed ten billion light years, uh, ten billion years ago, because it took ten billion light years to get to us. So we're looking back in time. And we don't know what's going on right now. It's been 10 billion years since this showed up. Now, we talked about dark energy and dark matter, remember? Well, there was a, a, a law that people, the scientists thought of, uh, of matter and energy being uh, constant. There was no interchange. And this is the only equation I'm going to give you, but it's critical. Matter and energy. There used to be the law called conservation of matter and energy, meaning that there was you had good matter and you had energy, and they were conserved, they were always constant. Einstein comes along and says, oh no, they're interchangeable. And you've got to get a sense of this here now. Energy is here, mass is there, and the speed of light, that number squared, is gigantic. Okay, so when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, you were talking about 25 pounds of fissionable material. 25 pounds is not very much. You multiply it by that, and you wipe out the city. This explains our sun, why it doesn't seem to run out. It's, it's a nuclear reaction. Now, Einstein had a good feel for this, and he had a general relativity theory. And, oh, this is not good. This is not good. Um, okay, is there a brighter light behind this room? I'll uh, describe it. What he did is he came up with another interpretation of, yeah, great, that would be a good idea. He came up with another interpretation of Newton's theory of gravity. And basically what he thought about was that the space-time continuum was bendable. And it's not obvious from this, but this is Earth in a dimple. It's like a you had a sheet and you put a heavy rock in it and it dips down. Okay? Now if you put a, a, a piece of a, a marble and throw it on that sheet, what's going to happen? It's going to round, roll around that dimple right down to the heavy object in the middle. So mass is affected by gravity. Okay? Now the other thing that's affected is energy. So we talk about mass and energy, material in what we couldn't see in the universe. The light is also bent. So you may be, uh, the light source may be here, and you're observing here, and you think, well, you're seeing it, but it's actually bending. Light bends around heavy objects, because the, the light also is affected by gravity. Okay, Bob? Technology is wonderful. <laughs> I have the number. 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 I have the number.
too many other. It was another. It was another piece of foot. It's okay now. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Now we talked about curved space in time. Okay. What effect does that have? We're getting to the, you know, the religion part of this, trust me. <laughs> Gotta go through the sides, okay? okay? There was a time when people thought, okay, where's the set? There was a time when we people thought that the earth was flat. There are actually some, there's a, still a flat earth society, believe it or not. <laughs> Yet the Greeks knew it was round. And most people ignored the Greeks, they, they were into the side astronomy. So, anyway, people thought that you walked and you fell off the edge. Well, the truth is, a person walking around the Earth comes back to the other side. Well, because space-time is curved, it's like walking on the inside of a basketball instead of the outside. This would be like walking on the outside of a basketball. Uh, walking on the inside would be the universe. So that if you had the time and the propellant, which we don't have, and you went one direction, you'd come back the other direction. And what's interesting is you would never sense an edge to the universe. When people say to you, what's outside the universe, it's a nonsensical question. And the reason is that we are trapped in the dimensions of space and time. We, can't, we don't know what it's like without that. It would be like asking a fish, what's it like to swim without water? If this fish could talk, he'd say, what are you crazy? What does that mean? You know? Well, the, obviously the creator is outside space and time. So when we talk about eternal life, in a sense our language is getting in the way. Because eternal means time forever. What we're talking about is something that we cannot conceive of outside. Now, electromagnetic energy was the second thing that Einstein considered. And it has a spectrum across various wavelengths. The visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum is only one ten trillionth of the total spectrum. Our vision is very limited. So, yes, we developed uh, equipment to look over here and convert the signals to visible so we can see it. But the truth is, our range is very minimal. So Einstein decided he wanted to have an equation, and he called it the unified theory, and he said, I want to put together an equation that will be one equation that will cover both gravity and electromagnetic energy. He only knew of those two forces. There are two more that were discovered later. And the two more that were discovered later became four forces, and you've heard of string theory and, and membrane theory equations. That was the latest attempt to come up with one equation, a unified equation, that would describe the universe. Well, he came up with an equation. I don't want to blow the punchline just a second here. <laughs> he came up with an equation, but the equation predicted that the universe had a beginning. Now, Einstein was susceptible to confirmation bias, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon, or if I get to it. He had paradigms, and he, he put a fudge factor in the equation, which means that he put in a, a factor just to force it to not predict the beginning, because he thought the universe was infinite forever. Well, Father Lemaitre, also a physicist, met with Einstein and convinced him that his first equation was correct. And he got him to take the fudge factor out, which predicted a beginning to the universe. So Father Lemaitre is considered the father of the Big Bang Theory. He's a Jesuit physicist. So the Big Bang Theory projected that there was going to be a huge expansion. It actually is not like a regular funnel. It was bigger in the beginning, very quick, and 
and then expanding out. And at various points along the way, things occurred. Okay. Well, this equation uh, enables uh, this equation enables us to go back and calculate what it was like at the beginning of the Big Bang. And these four forces, what they were like back then. And then there was a stunning discovery. Absolutely stunning. What happened is they discovered that those four forces developed into what is called the anthropic principle. The four forces of nature were so extremely fine-tuned at the Big Bang that the likelihood of the emergence of a single cell in the universe is like a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling the 747 from the materials therein. Mathematically, uh, Father Spitzer uh, is wonderful in this regard. Mathematically, that's one, a chance in 1 in 10 to the 10th to the 123rd. The number is so gigantic, you can't even do 10 to a, a, a number. You've got to do a double. This is, th this number is mind-boggling. Just trust me, it's just mind-boggling. What are the, the likelihood that life would come about? Well, it's clear that God was preparing for us right from the beginning. So, uh, I'll now cover some of the scripture as we get into it more. Now, special relativity was something Einstein came up with, and this is an experiment um, that um, Einstein, and this is the mind experiment that Einstein did, and he did these things like most scientists do, it's a mind experiment first. That's why scientists do, they think, well, you know, they contrive the experiment, they come up with a, a picture of what probably will happen, and then they go test it. So his, he was a, a patent, uh, he worked in the patent office in Switzerland. And one day he looked out the window and he saw the cock in the square, of the Switzerland square, and it said 1134. Okay? So then Einstein said to himself, well, why am I seeing the clock say 1134? Well, the sun is there, and it's showing a photon of light. Photon just a packet of light. And it hits the clock. And then, and then it bounces back to my eye. And that's why I see that it's 1134. It imprints in the eye, 1134. Well, that's pretty easy to follow, right? So now, don't be discouraged that people tell you, well, you'll never understand, uh, you know, space-time relativity. This is actually, it's pretty simple when you think about how Einstein visualized it. So, of course, this is speeding. The, the, the photons are coming in at this speed, 186,000 miles per second. So, then Einstein did a, limp, a leap, a wonderful leap. He said, what if the observer runs backwards at the speed of light? Can I borrow that, please? Let me hit the volunteer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pretend I'm writing 1134 on this thing, okay? And over here. I usually have a little golf ball trying to do this. Okay. So I write 1134. So if you're going to catch it, what time does it say on it? Okay, now I want you to run backwards at the speed of light. <laughs> Now what time does it say? 11.34. I'll be ignored. So what, is, what was the conclusion? Relativity conclusion is at the speed of light, time stands still. Now this is going to end up in prayer, believe it or not. But this is critical. At the speed of light, stand, time stands still. So now you've got a gentleman. I met the man. He's a physicist in Israel. And uh, here's what he thought about. This is how scientists think. We're a little bit weird. We're off the deep end. But something comes together and we realize this is consistent with my faith belief. On Earth today, the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. That's my traveling observer. You know, remember I said at the speed of light, time stands still. Well, we're going pretty slow here on Earth. Then, what if you rode the Big Bang wavefront? 
that a Big Bang exploded. And let's say you're riding on the wave front. Now, that's not, wave front's not traveling at the speed of light, but it's darn fast and it's accelerating. Gerald Schroeder applied the mass with Einstein's theories and determined that the age of the universe would be something like 6.5 to 7 days. Isn't this kind of weird? Where did that come from? Did Genesis have something to say about that? Okay. Now, I'm not talking about interpreting scripture literally. I'm saying this was his calculation. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now, because of the membrane theory, not just string theory, membrane theory is different dimensions, it's more dimensions. Uh, we can go back to the beginning of the universe and predict what happened, and very quickly, very quickly, at the beginning, minus 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, incredible. Um, <clears throat> gravity separates, strong nuclear separates, we can play better than that. Those are the other two forces I didn't mention. And then helium and hydrogen nuclei are formed, protons, neutrons, etc., pretty early on. Then the first stars develop at 0.4 million years, and we go on and our solar system, nine billion years. So, universe magnitude, where I should count, your designs, they would outnumber the sands. Big Bang, and all things were created, heaven and earth, energy and matter, these visible and invisible. This take on a new meaning now, than you had before. Through the into it, four forces to comprehend with all holy ones, what is the breadth, length, and height, and depth. These are the dimensions that are related to the forces. And to know the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. And then the anthropic principle. Before I was formed in the womb, I knew you. We knew we were coming. Unless you believe that a tornado is going to go through a junkyard and build a seven part seven. Except for that exception. He knew. He knew us before the Big Bang. Now, it's logical to go to chemistry because now from the singularity in those first few fractions of a second, atoms were being formed. Where does that take us? Well, atoms to Earth from stars, this is the life chemistry. Uh, hydrocarbons to amino acids, atmospheric logic, there are reasons for that. Uh, uh, amino acids went, went further through clay templates and then the story goes unknown. Science doesn't have the answer. Uh, there are a whole sequence of events that had to take place. There's a lot of speculation, hypotheses, etc. But one thing's for sure, that in terms of human arrival, uh, and I put a two footnote, if the 13.7 billion years is a 24 hour clock, humans arrive the last 38 seconds. We're latecomers. We are latecomers. Now, have you heard of the Hadron Collider in Switzerland? That's where they speed up subatomic particles around a big magnet. They swing them out. It's called the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Switzerland. And they spin some subatomic nuclear, subatomic particles at very high speeds through magnet, magnets that change, magnetic field. And, uh, Peter Higgs predicted that if you did that, you would come to a Higgs boson. And unlike Einstein's original theory where the universe was infinite, well, when he found that it wasn't, that was a shock to him. Well, also the subatomic is not infinite. There is a, a, a basic particle that they're searching for. They thought it was this. And you've heard the God particle? Let me tell you, that was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke by the scientists. They, they euphemistically called it, let's the God part. Of course, the press picks it up because the press doesn't know squat about science and makes a joke out of it and takes it seriously, okay? It, not knowing it was a joke. So, uh, it, it had certain, it, it, it carries the characteristics of all four forces and it was discovered in 2012. I was teaching a course on this and it was in the middle of the course they discovered this. I had to incorporate it. Now, talking about atoms, 
Uh, there's a distinction between quantum mechanics and Newtonian mechanics. Now, Newtonian mechanics said that if you uh, uh, you drive your you get your car, you drive to the market, or you walk, you just walk to the market. Uh, Newtonian physics said that well, you know you put your feet in front of each other and you keep walking, right? Well, quantum mechanics in the subatomic that didn't apply. In the subatomic level, if you were to apply subatomic to our daily lives, and which we don't experience subatomic because we live in where we are, but if you apply sub to the, the quantum mechanics to the life we live now, it would be like walking to the store and then instantaneously be in a block further with no record of passing in between, no time lapsing in between. It would be instantaneous. I mean, this was hard for physicists to buy because you had to think in terms of things you didn't experience in daily life. So these these electrons could jump from one orbit to another in an atom. So these, this is the, the uh, nucleus, but you've got these these electrons jumping between. Now, what that meant was scientists had to start thinking in terms of probability, not just absolute numbers, which meant that. The hydrogen atom, color-coded graphic probability density, is an example. Uh, they use the color coding to show where is the higher likelihood of the electron to be. Okay, because it had to deal with probability. They didn't know because it was jumping from here to there. Then comes along Heisenberg in 1927, and he develops the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. What this says, the more precisely the electron position is determined, the less precisely the momentum is known, and vice versa. Now, you may be saying, who cares? So what? Ah, this is a deep philosophic switch. Now scientists had to say, and they admit it, they agree, that, that nature is such that we cannot know it exactly. Nature is designed so science cannot know it Exactly. This is a profound issue, and scientists have accepted this principle as, as true. Science cannot know nature completely, even though a miracle is an indication we don't know the laws of nature completely. The invisible universe, large, who is no who no human has seen or can't see. Visual spectrum at present we see in the stickly as a mirror at present partially. Heisenberg's are the certainty principle. Great is our Lord, his understanding is infinite. He knows it all, we don't, and we can't. Now there's the concept of what's called the non-local universe. Scientists were experimenting with calcium atoms and they decided to bombard the calcium, calcium atoms with energy. And the calcium atoms have a pair of uh, a pair of photons that spin off, one's up, one's down, and they spin off. So the scientists decided, well, let's send them in a different direction. So they reflected them off 12 kilometers, seven miles. They measured, they changed the spin on one, and instantly the spin changed on the other. Not at the speed of light between, because science believes the speed of light is the fastest thing there is, but instantaneously. This is a quantum effect. This holds the potential for communications, because up or down is like the computer language of base zero, base two. No, it's electricity on or off, as opposed to our base ten system where we do that. This should, the Chinese have already applied this to communications over hundreds of miles successfully. So that instead of having a delay in your microphones or your phones, the communication will be instantaneous. The only reason it isn't instantaneous is because it takes technology and equipment to convert the signal to what you hear. This is profound. In theory, this could extend over the total universe. You could be on one side of the universe and instantly communicate to the other side even though at this current expansion rate, it would take 56 billion light years to traverse from one side to the other. Instantaneous. Einstein said, this is spooky. 
<laughs> Einstein said it was spooky, and it's accepted now. Now let's talk about chaos theory. How, how, is, uh, possible? Uh, how is possible? How is possible for us to have that instantaneous? How is it possible? It's part of the quantum effect, and the answer is they don't know. That's the bottom line. But but it's a quantum effect. It's not the speed of light. It's not what you're not transferring matter. You're transferring information. Information. You're transferring knowledge. <laughs> Hang with me. This is leading someplace. Yeah. Is it the sort of step that this person he can see instantaneously at different places appear to people? I mean, not only people, and even God can instantaneously at different places reveal himself. I mean, that's, I mean, that means that you say that you can contain God. God is outside of our own time and space, and that's why God can intervene in any time, time and space instantaneously. Oh, that's, that's, it. that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Now, let's talk about chaos, too. Okay. Uh, you had some, uh, the computers came along and they started being really powerful. And they thought, well, the first thing we'll apply to is weather. Because weather is complicated and it costs billions of dollars in lost production of, 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 of grain and things that are being grown if they could predict bad weather. So they tried and they started putting input into the computers. And uh, the, uh, the, the answers were didn't make any sense. And a good scientist looks back at the answers and says, well, does this make any sense? So they discovered then that it was the slightest change in the input changed the output. And basically, they discovered chaos theory. What they, they called this, uh, in applying it, was the butterfly effect. And as an example, excuse me, uh, as an example, basically what they said is if a butterfly flaps its wings in Beijing, the weather will change in New York. Weird. And what they were saying is there's so many variables we cannot, as human beings, calculate them. We can't even put them in the computer. The result is that chaos is not chaotic. Not chaotic. And then they graphed the results and they came up with what's called the Mandelbrot fractals. Now, if what this really says is if you if you take a little piece of this and you blow it up, it'll show the same pattern. It's a bigger picture. And then if you go deeper and deeper and do it again and again and again and again, it's infinitely the same going deep. It's a beautiful these are beautiful patterns that are clearly not chaos. It's so chaos is not chaotic. And there's uncertainty in the universe in our minds, but not in God's. Then we're getting to life, okay? Well, I was alive when this happened. It shows how old I am. And, and I ultimately got a degree in chemistry, so I was interested in this stuff. And uh, molecules were pretty simple back then. When these guys came up with the, the helix for life, I was blown away. I thought, how in the world? Did they ever conceive of a double helix? It was, it was just mind-boggling. Now, what are the DNA statistics? The DNA contains a complete code for the body. Every DNA. There are 4,600 trillion DNA molecules per unit. Pick any one of those DNA, and you can make another one of you. Because all of you is in one of those. Each one is 6.5 feet long. <laughs> DNA molecules, 6.5 feet long, it's ridiculous. And yet, it's, it gets into a 9.8 times 10 to the minus 5 inch average cell diameter. Which means that it's a compression ratio of 100,000 to 1. It's mind boggling. Now, evolutionary theory. Now, obviously, I'm jumping through a lot of topics here. Sorry, but that's just the way this is, okay? Uh, evolutionary theory is not against Catholic teaching, as you know, and it, it's actually indicative of how we used to think things were static. And one of the biggest mistakes all scientists have made is that things are static and fixed. Einstein, uh, 
the universe has always been here. Uh, you know, it, there was no beginning. It's always here. It's infinite. Uh, these are all misstatements, actually, misunderstandings of science. Well, evolutionary, uh, the theory of how God, God created man is partially that way, too. Because you look at Genesis, and you have to interpret that hermeneutically. You know, it's not just literal. Which means that, why is God relegated to space and time in a particular instant for creation? He doesn't. So Darwin basically said, and these were his main principles, you don't see him too often, variability, some forms are better adapted than others. Adaptiveness, adaptive, uh, adaptation and fitness, those forms that are better adapted will leave more offspring and thus increase in population frequency. And natural selection as environments change, some new form may become better adapted and increase frequency, etc. new species are formed. As it turns out, evolutionary theory is not linear. There are bursts in history, and then there are quiet periods. So, well, creation is an ongoing process. God is constantly creating us internally, too, which we're going to end up in prayer. And to show the oneness of creation, another human being has 99% of the DNA that you have. Now, both Vietnamese heritage, that may not be true, but between us, it's probably 99%. Okay. Chimpanzees, 97. Cats, 90. Fruit flies, 60%. Is that with us or with the same species? Pardon me? Is that with the same species or with us? Uh, this is between species. Oh, okay. got fruit fly and cats, obviously. So there's a huge sharing in the DNA. Is the DNA a scientific version of the body of Christ. Can you explain that? That's what you mean. Well, um, we believe in the body of Christ. We all are part of the body of Christ. We're all have a part of it. Uh, we all have the shared DNA. Where, you know, how deep does that body of Christ go? Uh, uh, primate evolution, I'm not going to spend too much time on evolution because uh, that seems to be, everybody gets all worked up about it, and I can't get too worked up about it. It's, I believe it, science accepts it, Catholic Church accepts it, so not a problem. But obviously, uh, we went, uh, we went through evolution through various uh, levels, and then finally humans about 10 million years ago. That's kind of a number you might want to remember. Uh, and then there's the modern connection common ancestries and how we lead to the various different races. And what's interesting with all this racism stuff you hear in the news, look up the term racism. People are changing the definitions right and left. I'm an old school guy. I mean, there were so many races and that's it. Anyway. Uh, and then the real interesting thing is with DNA uh, evaluation, they show that in, around Ethiopia was the first human and then migration then started to take place uh, the last point was South America. Uh, and I've, down, I've been down on the tip of South America, and I can tell you some of the uh, Indian tribes out there were pretty primitive. So uh, this is migration, not necessarily cultural development. Non believers, it's a large, you understand, it's an instance, am I God here again? Only it's a large, and I've got what you just said, brother. Yeah. You know? Where are the high created spirit for your presence? Where are the flu by ascend to the heavens? You are there. On high and well and holy is with the with the crushed and dejected spirit. To revive the spirits of the dejected, revive the heart of the crushed. DNA contents. So we are many or one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Yeah. So what I say is you know, uh, we allow the spirit to intervene in in the broken life, and that us was almost like uh don't think from the, was it, the eternal point of view, perspective, the intervening into our own kind of time and space. And when you are being uh, taken up by that eternal love, then you, from this own perspective, looking at everything, it's no longer chaotic anymore. And then it, it, all your life experience is meaningful. That's a chaos theory. So it's important for us to understand that when you are entering into a deep intimacy and listen to what Christ, and you see everything different. You, we talk about conversion, 
people, you know, in the past, you see their wife, their husband, like this, but after they've been through kind of person, mention kind of weekend, or they begin to be converted intellectually, emotionally, or, or psychologically, they begin to see everything different. They begin to see order in chaos. And that's the thing. It's important for us to know that science and, and, and theology uh, really are not really in con a con contradictory, but actually uh, uh, are really complementary because science re reveals the, the fact that everything we see is within that kind of boundary of time and space, and the universe is not, we are not able to get out of that. And there's a mystery beyond time and space, and that is instant. instant. Now, instantaneously, God intervened in our life and pulled us off this, away from this kind of limited point of view and spirituality helped us to be able to, to see deeply, to see profoundly, to engage much more uh, instantaneously with everyone. Uh, not quite the same, St. Francis, G.C. Uh, the way he was instantaneously at, at different places. Uh, he was able to perform miracles in different places because he becoming uh, uh, his majority of the DNA is Yeshu, Jesus, you know. And so that, 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 that we need to recognize that we become Christ when we really uh, inviting him into our life. And that is the mystery, you know. And actually, you know, the church, Vatican II, said what? The church become younger if the church is is taken over by the Spirit. That is the love of Christ. And that's why I say the love of Christ, the redeeming love of Christ will heal of you and will what, liberate you and liberate from the limitation of time and space in your own experience of, of life and also transform you and we rather help us transcend you go beyond that time and space. And just to add on to that, basically that's why I agree with you about it. Um, I said we were locked in and trapped into the dimensions of space and time. God can draw us out of those dimensions through contemplative prayer. And so that would be what we would talk next to this afternoon or as much as I can cover. But it actually, it actually can draw us out of space and time. Questions and answers. Now, I, uh, I asked if you want to just keep rolling. Yeah, good question. Keep rolling. Okay. What time did we end this one? Well, well, I got to say, uh, uh, yeah. we have to say, one hearing. Uh, um, Professor Mokasi, or Dickon Mokasi, he's a scientist and has been doing a lot of research. And he has been traveling uh, in Europe and giving a lot of books, and conferences, everything there. So uh, when we need to study, we need to, we need to really study Seriously, and you do research when you just don't talk something which is superficially. I mean, you really have to get to know the subject. So, what when you are preparing your classes, you have to really take it all in and simplify, simplify, simplify in such a way that when you share the story, the narrative of the church or the story of Christ, and the people can understand it's a matter whether what age is, what background they have. You see how simplified we make all these complicated subjects to us? Yeah? Maybe you go a little bit far, but really good for us to understand the taste of science and the, the, the profound mystery of science. Do you want to say something? Yes, before I mean, we finish with part one, I'm just uh, asking, I guess, your help, Professor and Father. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of theory that you cover. Some really so fast, definitely we can't fully really understand. But what would you say is the three takeaway for the group here? If anything you want for the first part anyway, what would be the three things that you want the group to take away? Of that first presentation. Yes. What are the three takeaways? Um, I can I, let me say it and then you, you say what you think. I think for you to understand the chaos theory, I mean, a lot of things listen, seem to be chaos when you really take a look, long, loving look and go deep into it. And you from the perspective of God, you see your life, you see everything, and you see there's order, there's meaning, there's structure in it. And if you, really, if you from the perspective of theology, if you really have a, a heart which is filled with Christ's love, will you see it? A lot of experiences in your life seem to be chaotic to me, meaningless. But if you take a long look, look in contemplative prayer and prayer in relationship with Christ, it becomes remaining in Christ, which slowly you see 
meaning with all the chaotic experiences. Oh, okay, that's the first thing. For me, for that's for me. Quant quantum physics, okay? I mean, instantaneously at different places. God can be instantaneously to relate to all of the people. I mean, how many people in the whole world right now? 60 some yes. millions people. Uh, uh, 60 some millions of beings. Uh, billions. Billions. billions uh, okay, that's what I did the last time I gave a talk in, in, in Taiwan. 60 some billions of people. And just imagine God instantaneously can relate to 60 some billions. Wow. That's now quantum physics coming as it's possible. Okay, it's God not limited by time and space. So miracles happen around because we don't understand, we never engage in the experience of that. That's the second one. And the, 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 the third one is that uh, we need to <coughs> respect the mystery. We need to be humble because a lot of things. I mean, the universe, how many, how many galaxies, how many, you know, the Big Bang in the, the dark, and you, what you see, only 4%. And the 9 six percent of the universe you didn't even see. And you know, how much you see yourself, how much you understand yourself, maybe less than four percent. Psy um, um, psychologists say, the most that we can understand P of ourselves is only less than five percent of our, un our, our consciousness. Our consciousness make up for the unconsciousness, the subconsciousness, the collective unconsciousness and collective subconsciousness. And in the Buddhist uh, study, they have all nine level of subconsciousness. You just imagine you yourself a mystery, a universe in itself. Do what you see about yourself really what God see? No. And the, the sadness, a lot of us we don't know ourselves, and we go around and tell people, you have to become like me. Uh, we learn to be humble. Okay, that's my dream. <laughs> well, I, I might add that, you know, the question is always, does God intervene in, in, in our lives and help? He can do that at the quantum level and not violate the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and also not enable us to figure out what he's doing. And that can lead to, a, that's on the micro scale. On the macro scale, that can lead to chaos theory where he's, he's helping us, but we will never be able to measure yeah. it. And so, that's another aspect of this. Okay. And that's the redemptive love. And so I'm going to go into the next section. I've got a little time. I'm not going to review the slides because we already did that. I'm going to jump right to the, the meat of it here. Biology of consciousness. Okay, the brain has been mapped pretty well. Pretty well. I'm not going to go into all the details, but there are certain sections that are uh, identified in some. Uh, basic emotions, body basics, language. In general, the frontal lobes play are the youngest, and the oldest is the cord, which is still part of the brain. And uh, most of our sensory perception comes from the back of the brain, and the front is very critical, the frontal lobes. Now, I'm not gonna go into this slide in detail, but if you believe in God, these are the parts of the brain that will help identify various aspects of God, okay? Uh, and maybe love can lead to emotional fear of God. I think if we're trained to fear God, it can be unhealthy. So science knows that. And if, it, if we're not trained that way, we're trained in God's love, it can be incredibly healing. Now, this kind of relates to the interesting thing I find, the cosmos and the brain. They're both gigantic. Both gigantic. Uh, brain 100 billion cells, 100,000 dendrites, 100 trillion dendrites, and what Father was just saying, very interesting, in the cosmos, physical, visible, 944%, invisible, 96, the conscious mind, about 5%, the unconscious is 95%. So, this is going to lead us into a very interesting discussion on the conscious and the unconscious. So this is interesting. That is, when I did my uh, study of uh, philosophy of religions, I did a lot of Buddha, Buddhist, uh, Buddhism, Buddhist studies and also Taoist study. And you know, most of the mystics, the contemplative uh, people like Buddha or like Lao Tzu, uh, like Zhuang Tzu, they already at that time, they, they were born before Christ, you know, and they all 500 years before Christ, as was Confucius and, and Lao Tzu. And they already anticipated, they talked about, we humans only understand 5%. 
And that's what I mean. And when you look at what they, they, they intuitively engage into the mysteries of, of, of the human body and the, and the whole universe. You, you talk about that, we, we listen, because I'm, I'm now fluent in Chinese. I did a lot of uh, study, uh, research on the, uh, the book Tao Te Ching in writing. That is just incredible. It's a more laboratory. Uh, uh, Tao physics, you read the book, you know, and all things, all of the, these things already conceptually uh, was really intuitively attained by these people, these philosophers, it's incredible. So, you talk about instantaneous kind of uh, revealing of God's love to all the people of all ages, you know, all time and mysteries. Maybe at that time they didn't encounter Christ because Christ was not incarnate, incarnate yet, but they experienced the love of God instantaneously, want to intervene in the history of humankind and to lead us back home to the other father. So there's a lot of things like that. You know, when I study uh, Buddhism and when I get into the nine level subconscious, oh, it's unbelievable. You know, Jung, Carol Jung. When did he learn psychology? When did he develop all the categories of his psychology? Now the whole department of psychology is really rely on Freud and Carl Jung. Carl Jung went to, went to India, that's where he learned all of the terminology of psychology. That's a lot of things. Well, the brain has various dualities. I don't want this term mixed up with non-dualism. This is something happening with the brain. And there are a lot of duality in the brain which forces free will because we have to make decisions between the right and left hemispheres because they can sometimes contradict uh, the information we're getting. We have to always deal with present and future. Uh, if you're an alcoholic, do you take the alcohol out of the room, out of the house, so that in the future you're not tempted? Uh, multiple stimuli, multi stable stimuli. This is those images where you, you see the the two women, uh, two men facing each other, and you see the the chalice, the cup, you know, the contradictory, mm -hmm. uh, motion and reason, but I'm going to focus on conscious and unconscious. Now, Phineas Gage was an interesting character. Uh, he was a, uh, a very religious man, went to church regularly, never cursed, didn't drink, didn't womanize. He was a, a model citizen, and he was the one that placed the charges uh, along in New Hampshire to make way for the railroad, and the charges were every 10 feet, and uh, there was a hole drilled, and then they put the dynamite in there, and he tapped it down, and then wired it all together, and they blew it off, and the, the rock fell off, and we went on. Well, one day, he tapped, and there was dynamite already in the hole. And the, the, at that time, they called them um, crowbars, but they were straight. One end was flat, one pointed. It detonated it, it went through his cheek and out the top of his head. Uh, and because it was so quick and it was also hot, it cauterized the wound and he healed. Very unusual. And they exhumed, this was back in the 1800s, late 1800s. And from then on, he womanized, he cursed, he was a horrible person. So as an outsider looking at him, they judged him and they said, you're evil, you're sinful, you're sin, you're going to hell, da 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 da. You've heard that stuff today, right? Okay. Well, this was a medic, big wound. And the science, science knows very little about the brain, trust me. But this was an obvious big wound. They could exhume his body, which they did about 30 years ago. And sure enough, his frontal lobes were gone. So the frontal lobes were, are critical to making moral decisions. Michael Minnick uh, had an accident when he was about a month old and lost his sight. And when he was 45, science had a way of restoring his sight. Now this is very rare in medical journals. And so the doctors didn't know how he was going to react. And so they had his children, his two children, his wife in front of him, whom he had never seen before. They unwrapped the bandages. And he was bombarded with this information. And it was, it was wonderful. The only problem was that the next day he couldn't remember what his wife looked like. He couldn't tell the difference between the forest and the trees. He had lack depth of the field. Wow. There were a lot of problems. What had happened is in the infancy, when our brain is wiring information into the unconscious, which is the fastest, it, it causes, he didn't have that benefit. So let's compare them. The unconscious is fast, automatic, implicit, heuristic, intuitive, reactive, impulsive, limbic system, and the oldest. 
conscious by brain, the four, the, remember the 5%? Slow, systematic, explicit, analytic. This is where we make our moral decisions. This is where we store our, our uh, prejudices, our, our sinfulness, and our virtues. But we're not conscious of them because we program over over time. But with time, he was able to reprogram his brain, and he didn't have to look for the dimple on his wife's cheek. He, or, pardon me, he didn't have to try to study his wife's face and figure out it was her. Unconsciously, he saw the dimple and it was her. So our unconscious brain is protecting us. If we had to think consciously about breathing, we would die. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, so I want to say something about the influences, you know, sometimes now we have the emotional intelligence, you know, yeah. and some people have that emotional intelligence, when you have a, you're about to have an accident, and suddenly there was something in you unconsciously telling you that, and you stop maybe one second or two seconds or one minute or twenty seconds before the accident happened. And then I know a friend of mine who was driving in, in the highway uh, up to the mountain in Taiwan, and suddenly he just stopped the car. And he was in a, an urge within himself, calling him to stop the car. And if he was continue driving that, the, the rock would fall down and hit the car and kill him. You know? Yes, just only 15, 15 seconds away, and he just stopped. And that's the, un, that the speed of the unconscious, that's the collective unconscious. Maybe there is something that we are communicating with our parents or someone who, who the loved ones who passed away, who just want to protect him. Maybe God coming at that moment, just give us that kind of very fast signal and telling us to stop. You know, that, I'm just telling you this, it's a lot of things that we have, don't know about the brain and, uh, and the mystery about how God intervened in our life. The un at the level unconscious, at the level collective unconscious, not all of the level, the consciously what we know actually really very little. Uh, only well, the studies on that have yeah. shown that the foot goes to the brake on the car before the conscious brain. Yeah, and what the even problem. you know that he's stopping. And he just pulled it down. Like that. That's it. That's correct. So all of these prejudices are stored in the unconscious. Now, does that mean if we are dealing in these, these prejudices, our sins, does that mean we're culpable in the eyes of God? Only God knows the answer to that. But obviously, the idea is to get these to come to the conscious brain so we can deal with them. Now, to show you how much confusion there has been, consciousness. The, the Greek word synesis means consciousness, which is the external self-awareness. So you either, there's either true or erroneous. I either look out there and see a tree, and it really is there, or I think it is there, and it isn't. Okay. The conscience is the internal God, and that's either sincere or insincere. Are you really rationalizing insincerely? Well, the Greeks only have one word for both of these, and those are critically different. Believe it or not, the Romance languages still only have one word. French, Spanish, English is fortunate that we have two. So, moral culpability. This is theology. Uh, Active omissions are morally wrong. Only the informed conscience can determine that. But the full knowledge of a person, if they have full knowledge or full freedom, only God knows that. So, Phineas Gage? Ooh, wow, maybe not. Obviously not, but there are some, there are molecular level damages in the brain that we don't understand. That's why we can never judge somebody and say they're going to hell. And most of our uh, brethren in other Christian denominations don't make the distinction between the subjective and the objective. They, they will, if they see somebody shooting somebody, they'll say that person committed a sin. We as Catholics can't say that. All we can say is that that was morally wrong and that uh, whether it's a sin in God's eyes, if they're culpable in God's eyes, only God knows, because only God knows these. So, this is for profile indication, supernomic judgment. Only God knows that. Right. And then the, the person may be inflicted with a lot of things unconsciously. So we have to be more compassionate. Uh, this is moral, this is way, way ahead of most of our Christian brethren of other denominations. They don't make this distinction. I do a lot of interfaith dialogue. I haven't seen this distinction in other Christian denominations. Have so, you, Father? Huh? No, they, no. They, they're more black and white. They don't, yeah, it's all black and white. So there's a collective facility. Catholics should never be black and white, you know? Because we are not God. Don't play the role of God. 
Yes, we humans. And the humans who submit to the divine guidance and the intervention. That, that, that's the, the lesson we need to learn you know, humility. So there is such a thing as collective consciousness, which is what is best in science, what do they have to say about it? And collective conscience, which is well, what, are, what is your religious, what do the religions believe? Well, what is the state law, civil law, etc.? And religions also has it, it, its own distortions, its own kind of uh, prejudice, prejudices. So you have to be careful. Uh, I mean, sometimes some people are and, 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 and interpreting the teaching of the church. And maybe this interpretation is not with the church teaching, it is its own kind of seeing the church teaching, understanding the church teaching. But because he has the conscious or unconscious uh, prejudice against uh, that teaching, you know, so that's why you need to come aware of yourself. So I just invite you all need to learn to cultivate a deep love for Jesus and to remain in Him, to let Him uh, change you, transform you, to become more like Him. That's when you are doing that, then you can present to the people the teachings of Christ. Now, I'm not going to go to all this, but when you do it in front of conscience, and these are not a norm or priority, but you've got to consider a lot of things religious teaching, sacred scripture, natural law, civil law, a whole bunch of things. And so it's all got to be considered. Now, omnipotent God, frontal lobe, stop judging that you will not be judged. Unconscious brain, stop judging, you will not be judged, stop condemning, and you will, be, you will not be condemned, forgiven, you will be forgiven. The science shows us we've got to do this. There's no other option. Okay, there are research conferences. I've given presentations at each of these, but I won't dwell on Secular uh, Buddhist uh, conference is here. Uh, this was Disorders of Consciousness uh, by an expert. And uh, the these are dualistic, and these are non dualistic. Well, there have been conferences brought here to Houston, uh, Harvard University of Chicago, and there's a huge amount of research on the healing effects of, of a belief system. And it's compiled in a handbook of religion and health. This is the, the gospel book, basically, which compiles all the research. Um, and, uh, I'm the director of the Center for Faith and Coaching, and then, uh, Bob has seen also that young professors at the university, and we also have the uh, Spirituality Institute. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, and you are a member of that. So between the two uh, places, we really uh, are doing a lot of conferences, inviting the top, top scholars, top, top scientists, and, and to come up together, do a lot of presentation. And these are lifetime research uh, kind of uh, insight that they have to present. So I'm just asking you, you have, like well, with, uh, Bob and I continue to study and learn and learn and learn all the time. It doesn't matter where you are, you have to learn, you have to study, because you, the speed of knowledge that I know is so fast, and then you are not stop learning, you don't know. And the more you learn, the more you become humble, the more you recognize you don't know anything. Okay? And that is the, 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 the heart of the scholar. You have to become a scholar by that nature. You have to learn. I'm so happy to return to after being away 15 years ago to the back university, and then I'm a miss of all of the, 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 the professors and the research the scholars. So it's good to be there to learn, and you recognize you don't know a lot. So just keep learning, learning. There are three areas of the religious research. One, if you have a faith belief, you heal better, and you have a much better. Uh, sense of well-being. If you attend church regularly, once a week, and now this is not saying any particular religion, okay, uh, then you live up to seven years longer. <laughs> <laughs> if you prayer practice, you have a prayer practice, and I was involved in this research, uh, you have lesser chance of depression. Do you know why? you know tell me why? Because you are relating to God, and God pouring His own energy into your life, and then He gives you that healing, the liberating and transforming power, and remove the chaos, make chaos from a water. And, uh, I'm going to be focusing mostly on, uh, on uh, prayer, but just very quickly, these are all the studies that have shown religious involvement improves. It's just incredible. 3,000 medical articles, etc. It's just unbelievable the amount of research. So this is solid by Harvard, University of Chicago, Institute of Spirituality, Health Department. Um, fertility rates, I think this is important. 
Uh, as we're, we're in the biology of consciousness section, well, now that we're conscious of what's going on around us, one of them is fertility rates. That's defined as a number of, of babies born per woman. Okay. Now, in the U.S., it's 2.1. Now, to maintain a culture, you have to have at least 2.1 to have that culture survive. No culture has survived at less than 1.9 here. Maintain a culture. Wow. Okay. Now, U.S. is about 1.6, but with immigration, it's 2.1. France, not good. 1.6 in England. Look at Italy, where Rome and Vatican are. 1.2. Uh, 1.1 in Spain. What this means is that cultures of death, which includes uh, abortion, birth control, and capital punishment, ultimately die out themselves. Their belief system is not self-sustaining. And also homosexual uh, yeah. mm -hmm. that homosexual relation and marriage. You know, right? that, that dies out eventually, too. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm not saying there would be no longer homosexuals. But the, the mentality of that being okay would die out, basically. Uh, cohabitation sociology. Uh, you're going to run into people that are living together. I did marriage prep. And I, the way I approached it is I would say, I'm here to help you in a long lasting marriage. Do you agree with that? And say, oh, yeah. So I guess that's the only reason I'm here. So instead of preaching to them morals, they know they're not stupid. I say, let's talk about the science. Okay? If you live together, premarital sex, obviously, uh, then you have a 40% greater chance uh, of not get, not getting married. 50% uh, greater divorce rate. If you're in Europe and you live together there's a, and then get married, there's an 80% greater divorce rate. Uh, if, if you're a, a greater divorce, if it's a non-virgin bride, greater divorce, male infidelity is cohabitated. Uh, a greater female is the infidelity cohabitated, and the list goes on. And the, the uneducated, unless the high school diplomas or whatever, have a higher rate of cohabitation. So this is something that when I get the people's attention, then I'll say, oh, by the way, that happens to be Catholic Church teaching. Oh, so. So how did you get this book, Samuel's number? They did a lot of research on it, right? Yeah, the yeah, well, there's the a lot of research on that. Now, there's more recent research that started to say, well, we didn't, they try to eliminate things which skews the results because some people don't want to see this. <laughs> so even scientists have their bias. Uh, meditation practice. This was from Herb Benson of Harvard. He's done this research. Uh, we can go into that. Now, in the terms of the terminology, meditation is from the Latin meditatio, meaning to engage the imagination to think. Our modern terminology of meditation is a much broader meaning. So the term has been absconded with by other faith beliefs. Uh, it's also been, uh, meditation has helped in prayer. Uh, is one of the highest level things used for prayer management. It's a shared service. These are the sources. Um, now, this is where we're going to loop back on the universe. This Penrose guy, you ever hear of him? Brilliant guy. He was the one that Hawkins went to to get his math. Because Hawkins didn't have the math he needed, so he got advice from Penrose, who was also at Cambridge. I met Penrose, he's 87, he was in Switzerland about six weeks ago. That's brilliant. He's trying to come up with a quantum mechanical, he's a quantum physicist. Quantum physical explanation of consciousness. That's where the research is going. Consciousness seems to be but such an important phenomenon that I simply cannot believe that it's something accidentally conjured up by a complicated computation. It is the phenomenon whereby the universe's very existence is made known. One can argue that a universe governed by laws that do not allow for consciousness is no universe at all. Now, you see us looping back from the physics of the universe down to the brain. That's where the science is going. And of course, here de Chardin, the most talented and profound way of describing the evolution of the universe and undoubtedly to trace the evolution of love. And there is almost a central longing for communion with others who have a large vision, the immense fulfillment of friendship between these, those engaged in furthering the evolution of consciousness as a quality impossible to describe. Father Terry de Chardin. You remember the last word, evolution of love. Yeah. That's more important. 
Okay, now here's the here's the problem. This is science did studies on this. What science studies on was uh, they they uh, interviewed people and they said, well, uh, what religion are you? They just took a survey. What religion, what political party, uh, what academic academic level do you have, and what you know, they kind of whatever. So then they gave them a series of multiple choices and they said, We have done studies and we know that if uh, that here's here are two studies that confirm that being uh, a Catholic is better than being a, a Buddhist. And then there are two studies that being a Buddhist is better than being a Catholic. Or political parties. Okay. People would statistically pick the options that that their preconceived ideas fit before they started, which is confirmation bias. This means that it, it's uh, it's a it's it's a rash, it's not a rash, it's automatic, it's even unintentional, it's not deliberate, it's not deception, it's eminent. It's cognitive me me mechanistic, uh, it's evidence confirming beliefs, rational privacy effect, illusory correlation. Basically, people in their unconscious are picking the things that meet their preconceived ideas. Yeah, that is so important right now because it's the unconscious bias. And this is really uh, control all of us. We are then none of us are born with like the uh, the, the, the plan habit. <laughs> but we all of us have a lot of biases. You we have uh, I mean, our physical, uh, our, our brain, and our emotional and our psychological. All at different levels have different biases trying to control and trying to manipulate us. So sometimes the learning is what come to know oneself and to be aware of these biases so that we will not become slave to these biases. When, well, why do I see you suddenly? I don't, I, I never interact with you, but I don't like you. Because you may be, there is some bias in me that's causing me to make a kind of adjustment about you and make a decision about you. So a lot of things going on, so we need to be able uh, to be more aware of these kind of, so what do you call that? Confirmation. Confirmation bias. Now the question is, how do we have, how do we get confirmation bias out of our unconscious into our conscious brain? That's the challenge. And how do we do it? Well, we're going to get into that. Confirmation bias. Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Everything goes into the first to come outside, but not from the outside. So basically, these evils are coming through from our unconscious, from within. And we're unconscious of them, so how can we do it? That's why habitual sin is such a problem, because it's buried even deeper in the unconscious. Now, the question is, how do we get out of that bad situation? Um, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I'll tell you. I do some prison ministry, and I, we were in prison, and this uh, black convict came to me. And he didn't want to share this with the other people, because they're very private. And they I don't know what they could get beat up for some charities and ideas, but he trusted me. He said, I feel, I, I don't know what to do. I feel scared when I get around a policeman. And he said, and I know that's wrong, but I don't know what to do. And I said, well, that doesn't mean that you are uh, a, a white policeman. And I said, that doesn't mean you're a racist. Well, that's not what you hear in today's press. <laughs> I said, that really means that you had a bad experience and your brain is trying to protect you from having that again. So it buries that into the unconscious. Then I challenged him. I said, now, a white woman is afraid of black men. Is she racist? And the answer is the same as I gave you. She had a bad experience. She's trying to protect herself. That doesn't make her a racist. She's got that buried in her unconscious. Both of you have to get that out of the unconscious. Prayer is the answer. Me. There are two types, discursive, cataphatic, and contemplative apathetic. Um, we're all used to the first one. We know how to pray with our mind and thoughts, and then sometimes use our mouth, perhaps too much. Uh, <laughs> please, you can tell I'm doing that right now. Um, share, these, are, these two are shared by all theistic faiths, and sensory prayer facilitates contemplative or mystical prayer. That's what I wanted to get across. So, the quote of the agreement here is our contemplation of him is a participation in his contemplation of himself. Wow. Merton. Travis. I never met him, but I was at the, at the monastery. He 
use that same permit. Now, are you ready for this one? Albert Einstein. Do you think mystical experiences are justified? Religious people? No, they're much more common than you realize. Matthew 6.6 6 is probably one of the most important. It should be M-A-T-T. Matthew 6.6 6 is when Jesus was asked how do you pray. He didn't say the Our Father first. He said, when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your heavenly Father in secret, and he will hear you in secret. Do not be like the pagans who use many words. Whoa. Then, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, we're going to use words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, etc. Uh, and this is probably the most mystical line of all at the beginning of the Song of Solomon. He went about doing his good and healing all, etc. So, uh, there's the prayer definitions are simple prayer method to facilitate contemplative prayer, contemplative prayer, opening whole being to God. Now, the Desert Fathers and Mothers, and this is a guy who wrote the longest work in Christian antiquity. And it became the main reference book by uh, the uh, rules of, by St. Benedict. He established the rules of Benedict for the commons and monasteries. And he's the, what Cassius says, the mind rejects the whole wealth and abundance of thoughts. The soul then pours out God to God wordless prayers. This is fourth century. And this, he was acting like a press reporter. He was going interviewing the nuns and monks in Egypt, who were the predecessors to the commons and monasteries. Now this is the guide, these are the guidelines for practicing separate prayer. We're not going to do it now. You take a sacred symbol or image, word or image, you can your intention to be with God. You sit in a comfortable position, introduce the symbol of God's presence. Then as thoughts become, and they will because we're human, if you have a thousand or two, it doesn't matter. Uh, every time you become aware of the thoughts or aware you're engaged with the thoughts, you ever so gently return to the sacred word which is your way of saying I'd rather be with you, God, than even my own thoughts. Ooh, I got involved in this because I, my prayer life was hard. I was telling God what I needed, when I needed, and how I needed. I basically didn't need God. I was giving him instructions. Okay. And it was a gentle readjustment. And there are a lot of different thought categories. I'm not going to go through them because we don't have a lot of time. But there are a bunch of different thought categories. But most of them are pleasant, but one of them can be unpleasant. It's the unloading of the unconscious. That's where we're headed. We're trying to get away from that confirmation bias. Physical effects, a lot of benefits. Less sleep means uh, you don't need as much sleep. Not that you don't, can't sleep. <laughs> um, spiritual effects, the gifts of the spirit. Most, the most common one is peace. Psychological effects, there's a focus for the Groups for the false love, which is a dependence on energy centers, esteem, power, security, things that are not going to give us happiness. To the true self, the union with the indwelling God. It's called centering here because God is all within. Brain scans by Franciscan nuns doing centering prayer show neuroplasticity by Newberg. He was Jewish, by the way. Uh, now here's interesting. Transcendent consciousness shares some character from some things with near-death experiences. Some similar attributes. And why shouldn't it? Because both of those are transcendent states of consciousness. In other words, these are the transcendent states between this life and the next. Uh -huh. So the first is a paranormal out-of-body. Near-death experiences talk about that. The same is true of real mystical experiences. Now by that I don't mean the normal peace we might feel if we had centering prayer, but there are less than 5% of the people that actually have a really profound experience. I'm talking about these are rare, both of these are rare. Uh, the next, next attribute they share is a cognitive timelessness uh, in NDE and the spiritual contemplative experience. It, prayer seems like 5 minutes, it was 20 or 30. Effective peace and a, a whole is a sense of perfection, and then a transcendent divine spiritual sense. And 
long ago to share these, and there's actually a scientific scale used to measure these called the Grayson scale. Okay, here's the research we just finished in Cuba. And um, it's a long story, I'm going to make it short. Uh, basically, it just presented at the Conscious, Science of Consciousness Conference in Italy, in Switzerland, about six weeks ago. And uh, they are still searching for consciousness. That's where it happened with Beth Penrose. And we first had to pick a tool. We picked this tool because it's important to get a tool that's very good in spatial, showing us where in the brain something's happening, and temporal, very good in speed. So we picked that tool, quantitative electroencephalogram tomography. And the conclusions were this. Significant, that's the tool we used, correlations across broad frequency ranges between remembering and the EMSC. We had to do remembering because you're not going to catch it in the act. But my neuroscientist, MD, who was the guy who did this, and I'm not a neuroscientist, assured me that that is pretty valid because that's the basis of PTSD. People remember. They hear a firecracker and they are brought right back to Vietnam or whatever in the war. Uh, and, and consistent with the Grayson scale attributes, most frequencies are higher with SC consistent that, that the SC is not dying. In other words, the, the remembrance was stronger for SCE. And I'm not going to go through all these uh, frequencies. Now, there are transcendent events. I can't believe it. There are both frequencies. There are, both, there are transcendent events that we just talked about. And I wasn't the first one to write about these. Father Dr. Moody described this. He's a classic uh, in 1975 uh, for uh, near death experiences. And Dr. William James described mysticism in the lives of religious experiences long ago in 1902. But scientists at those times were still reluctant. Well, now there's this conference I just talked about in Switzerland. Uh, science is on top of this subject. They're, they're going after consciousness like there's no tomorrow, and they cannot put their arms around it. I, I listened to the whole conference, and they're just not quite there. But yeah, I gave a presentation on this. You know, I just did a bit more, I gave a brain scan and all that stuff. But is there another transcendent event that shares these same attributes? Notice outside space and outside time. Now think back to the physics into creation. Give me the answer. What's the next event? The singularity of the Big Bang. It's dimensionless. There's, there's no material there. It's the size of a photon in the eyes of physicists. It's timeless because there's no light. Now, entropy <coughs> measure of disorder in the universe. In the second law of thermodynamics, most people know it, it says that entropy is always increasing. Well, entropy was zero at the singularity. It was perfectly ordered. And the forces were unified by Einstein's equation. Einstein's theory led to these singularity attributes of the Big Bang. Why shouldn't these be all transcendent events between this world and the next? Why shouldn't we be drawn by God and given a taste of what it's like outside space and time? Because when we are letting go of our thoughts from our conscious brain, then that allows room for the conscious brain to unload. I've seen it happen. Talked to 10 people. Three months later, I ran into one of them. I said, how's it going? He said, well, not too good. I said, what happened? He said, well, during the prayer, I remembered what really happened to me in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't go into detail, but it was a PTSD moment. I said, what did you do? He said, I ever so gently let it go and return to God. The divine healer was helping him. I talked to him. I told that to the head of the psychiatric department of Baylor. His eyes popped out. He couldn't believe it. I taught 10 people centered in prayer. Three of them had had your death experiences previously in life. I didn't know that. At the end of their first 20 minutes sit, the three of them start to share that they had actually re experienced their near death experience in that 20 minute prayer session. We're all headed there. We're all headed there. I've been looking for 
there's somebody that hasn't died and I haven't found one yet. So there's a perfect uh, place to aim today. And we have to thank uh, Dickon Blatassi uh, uh, for his incredible presentation. This with what I shared this morning regarding Jesus' redemption really bring us the three kinds of power, the power of healing, the power of liberating, and the power of transformation of friends and me. And I think the just the, 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 the time you said, it basically when you enter into Christ, you remain in Christ, you become united with Christ, you enter into that singularity of God, the Trinity. And in that moment then you um, you experience that sense of healing. Healing means sometimes uh, you let the Holy Spirit go deep down into your unconscious level, or uh, different levels unconsciously, and to begin to do the, the works of healing. God will very, work very hard try to heal all of the wounds and hurts of our past, of our unconsciousness. And then we need to be willing to empty, to let go. And then prayer, the Timothy prayer basically relieves your defensive mechanism. So let God enter your life and let God do the cleaning, the, uh, the, the, the healing, and the liberating, and open up all of the, what is it, the, the, what is it, the tie, the knots, yeah? and then let you free, deliver, liberate you, and transform you, and make you become able to experience the transcendent aspect of your life. You know, it's really, I mean, science and theology are coming together. I, I was at Berkeley. And I went to many conferences on theology and science, you know. And you know, when when we list you listen to so all the scientists talking about quantum physics, you know, and chaos theory. I mean, yes, you just recognize that these people are really affirming the mystics of the ages, you know, of different cultures, different religions talking about their experience of, of the divine power in their life, you know, the transcendence aspects, Rana. Uh, and Carl Rahner is a famous theologian of the church. He talked about transcendental kind of desire of human nature and also the historicity. We all are, are, are a condition by time and space, but yes, and, and, and two, the, the desire for God, we can transcend our own time and space and go into that kind of union with the universe so that we can experience the oneness with God and the oneness in love. And that was uh, what he didn't talk about. Uh, uh, the evolution of love. Okay, this is kind of the wrap up, basically, what they're all talking about, which wraps up the first and second, the second parts of the talk. Thank you so much. Did you still have any interest? The second part of the presentation, uh, you go into even more profound. And I'll do more, more questions and answers. Yeah. And we have a lot more questions because I think the more we study, Today, you, you, do you feel like science and, and theology are against one another? No. Uh, and then really, science helps us to understand and to attend that sense of awe, you know? Oh, wow. I mean, when you see all these numbers, how can the mind capture all these? Uh, the universe, the galaxies, and the black hole, and all these things are so infinite. And we cannot, and our mind is so small, but this mind is so small, but it's, it's almost like the universe, you know? And that's incredible how complicated our brain is. Right? But you know, sometimes we think that we know it. I just said to you, we know only maybe four or five percent of it, and then we think that we know all. And that is the arrogance of human mind, and I why make us commit sins and the devil can begin, begin to take advantage of our own arrogance and then and, and, uh, mislead us and spoil us. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. How can we apply the chaos theory for our own life, in our own spiritual life, or, or faith life? Okay? Uh, there are a lot of experiences we have in our life which very seem to be very chaotic that we do not understand. See, a tragedy, uh, uh, an accident, a sickness or uh, unpleasant experience that's happened in our life and make our life become chaotic and disordered and unhappy, yeah? confused and disoriented. And all of these are really chaotic. That we, we, we don't make sense. We, we don't find meanings. And if we don't find order uh, in those experiences, when we just experience that, okay? uh, but then we will change the perspective. After many period of prayer, and you take time away from the experience and going through it, go into it, 
and to look deeply into it, look it from the perspective of God, you begin to see the meaning, the purpose of the experience. And maybe 20, 30 years from now, when you look back, you say, thank you to God that I went to that experience with that experience, I would not be who I am right now. So that's time you begin to see all the acting of how God involves in your life to make sense out of some things to be, seem to be disordered and chaotic. So, because we don't see the totality, we see only 4% of the reality, and the rest of them is in dark matter or, 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 or of the, the, the dark, uh, the dark matter. So, that's why we don't see it. So, don't jump to conclusion too fast. Be patient, trusting in the providence of care of God. Slowly engage yourself in unpacking the gift that God's giving you, and you begin to see that every single event that's happening in your life, God concurred, God concurs in your experience. C-O-N-C-U-R, God allows us to <coughs> God get involved with it and try to reveal us how much you love to us. And if we have the faith, we, we stand on the point of view, what perspective of God, and we will see everything we lose. Be grateful to God because of those experiences in our life. So every chaotic experience can become a grace-filled experience. That is me. Now, prior to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and chaos theory, scientists thought that it, it was, you know, in nature was predictable. Okay. In other words, what they call what's called scientism, which is an extreme position. Uh -huh. Scientism says everything can be described by Science. Well, those two things just explain that even scientists now recognize they can't. Uh -huh. The religious uh, analogy to that is fundamentalism. You've heard of that. I mean, they interpret scripture literally. Uh, science is not important. Both of those extremes are wrong. So the big question then became one well, does God intercede in nature to help us? And if he does, how does he not violate St. Augustine's quote? Well, now, he can intercede at the micro level, subatomic level, through quantum uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. He can change things without violating the uncertainty, without violating the rules of nature. And we wouldn't know because scientists agree that we can't know nature completely. In fact, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle basically put us in put science in the post of saying nature is designed such we can never know it completely. And then on the micro, macro level, it goes to chaos theory. We still can't make a determination. So God, yes, God can and does in my belief system intervene and it doesn't violate the laws of nature. And, and that's important because when you talk about the uh, teaching of the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit can really actually get involved in the micro level, <laughs> the subconscious level, at the level that we can never detect and understand. And actually that's happening. God's doing a lot of healing in our own unconsciousness and the different layers of unconsciousness in our sub 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 or unconsciousness le at that level and that level we cannot even take the picture we cannot see it which even science can never understand that we never rule at us we, for the rest of our life we never come to understand the mystery of God mercy and providence so you can see that this chaotic theory and all of these, the quantum physics is really help us to recognize uh, that really there's a mystery of God's infinite love. And God is instantly can be at different level, mm -hmm. micro level and macro level, and can do a lot of transformation just for the good of us. Okay. How do we see and how we come to believe God? That's we need to learn to recognize we are so small. But this is small, like the sand on the uh, uh, the, the sand, the grain of sand in the in, in the uh, on the beach. But God's infinity love us. So the whole universal, uh, the whole universal reality is in our brain, in our, in our whole being, in our DNA. You know, it's amazing. The more you talk about science, the more you you you, you come to believe that God's infinite wisdom and mercy and love. Well, the, uh, I just gave a talk at the Science for Consciousness conference in Switzerland about five or six weeks ago. 
and I will share with you what I presented. But that's been around for 25 years, and that is the, the frontier of research. It's what is consciousness? Uh, the frontier of research is trying to determine that. They've been working on it for 25 years, and I was there listening to a lot of the talks, and I can tell you science isn't anywhere close. But the brain has been mapped. I mean, we, we have a pretty good idea of where certain functions are in the brain. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but I can tell you overall that the frontal lobes are the youngest part of the brain and the one that makes the moral decisions. The stem is the oldest, and uh, here, you know, you have memory, basic emotions, language, a lot of the uh, uh, perceptions of the outside world through our five senses is in the back. Okay? okay can I say something? Yeah. Uh, you can hear a lot about called intelligence, uh, as you can say, EQ, EQ, intelligence, uh, emotional intelligence. Huh? And th this one, hypothalamus, uh, this one, the brain is very small. Huh? But this is really have a quantum physics kind of movement. Huh? And when you are encounter some danger, and sometimes you have in, uh, intuitive uh, <coughs> kind of reaction and it is help you to stop at the right time before the accident happens or something um, uh, disaster uh, disaster to happen in your life and this will bypass all of the communication in your computer system in your brain it will go straight to your action your movement and tell you just like when you're riding a car like this morning I share my friend was driving on uh, the road in the mountain in, in Taiwan, in Ali Shan, the very tall, and, and suddenly he just stopped the car. I mean, it was so fast, he stopped within maybe 30 seconds. And then, if he just continued to ride, the, the rock would fall down on his car and kill his whole family. But he just stopped, and, and he doesn't understand why did he stop? He just stopped. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the professor uh, Bob Hesse said that uh, it just bypass all of the, the, the brain yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then go directly to the feet and tell the feet to put on the brain. And what, what will well, say? studies have been done on that, and I'll be talking about conscious and unconscious, but studies have shown that the foot moves to the brain before the brain recognizes the problem. And they'll, they'll talk about conscious and unconscious. So, anyway, it's been pretty well mapped, but the, the truth is, Science knows very little about the brain. Now, I won't get into this too much detail, but if one believes in God, these are the various parts of the brain that will perceive God in different ways. So the occipital parietal will identify God as an object. Parietal frontal gives our relationship with God. Frontal integrates intellectual and religious God. The thalamus gives holistic emotional sense of God. The amygdala can lead to emotional fear of God. Studies have shown that if you have a religion that teaches a fear of God, uh, you've got some serious um, illness coming to these people. They're, they can't heal very well. So love is the key. And studies have shown if you have a religion that teaches fear, uh, there's serious mental problems. Striatum can lead to emotional security in God, and the interior singlet can lead to loving God. So there are parts of the brain that will relate to that. If, if you believe in God. Now, in terms of the relative magnitude, just to give a sense of not only the size of the universe that we talked before, but how big this brain is, too. Um, 100 plus billion galaxies, 100 billion cells in the brain. Um, 200 plus billion stars per galaxy, 1 billion neurons. <clears throat> in other words, the brain is extremely complex. But this is interesting. In the visible and the non and the invisible on the cosmos, 90%, according to four percent is visible, 96% invisible are going to be dark matter. The conscious brain uses about five percent of the real estate. The unconscious about 95% of the real estate. Uh, interesting, interesting that those are similar. Now there are dualities in the brain. Now I don't want to get the term dualities mixed up with uh, the belief system that we can as Catholics have. The principle behind these presentations is that uh, we have, in our faith, we have non-duality. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, there's non-duality principle. In other words, we believe the body and soul are meant for each other. We're reunited with the body in, in heaven. 
the God and man are meant for each other, and God will share some of his divinity with us. Uh, and faith and science are meant to be together, complementary. Now this is different than, say, Buddhism, where that's dual. And so I was in Myanmar not long ago, formerly Burma, and I recall when I was young that the monks, because they were angry at the leadership, which was terrible, immolated themselves. And that was not suicide. And then their standpoint, they were killing just the body because they were going to get another body. So dualism and non-dualism are fundamental to how we approach this. Okay. So there are right and left hemispheres in the brain. You've heard people say, well, I'm right brain, you're left brain, left brain more language, right brain more math or whatever. Uh, and there have been surgeries conducted to split the two and a half to avoid epilepsy. Uh, and it has some very strange effects because the brain is disconnected. Uh, present and future are dualities that we have to deal with. If you're an alcoholic, uh, you put the, the liquor away, you, you sell all liquor and get it out of the house because when you're really desirous of it, if it's not there, you won't take it. So. You're essentially dealing with the present to shut up to deal with the future. Um, multiple stable, stim stable stimuli. Uh, this is the images that you've seen, the two faces facing each other. You say, well, those faces are is that the contour of the cup. You know, they're again, most people can't see both at the same time. Emotion and reason, and conscious and unconscious. Now, I'm going to explore the conscious and unconscious, because that's critical. Phineas Gage. Interesting story, hard to see, but he's holding a tuba, a plot, a, a crowbar, and in the late 1800s, the crowbar was straight with flat end and pointed top, about six foot long crowbar. You'll notice his left eye is closed. Phineas Gage was the person who put the charges along the highway in New Hampshire, and the way they making way for the railroad, so he blasting the rock away. The way they do that, and you may have, if you've driven around that part of the hall or anywhere, you may see uh, a series every 10 or 15 feet of semi-cylindrical sections. And what they did is they drilled the hole, they planted charges, went to the next one, but, and then they detonated them all at the same time, and the rock just flops off. Well, he was the guy that tapped the charges. Well, one day, and by the way, he was a really religious man. He didn't drink, he didn't curse, he didn't womanize, uh, went to church all the time, model husband. The community thought he was wonderful. Uh, and then one day he went to tap in the charge and there was a charge already in there. And then this is what happened. It launched and because it was pointed on the end it went right through. It went below his left eyeball and came out the right front part of his brain and because it was pointed and happened very quickly because all that force was like a rocket and because it was hot it, car it, it, it carterized the wound so he healed so it was very very unusual to have that major wound and survive there was a problem when it happened and it got all done he started to drink curse didn't he womanize he didn't attend church and everybody in the community said he's, he's, he's evil, he's going to hell, he's sinning. They condemned him. Well, in about 20, no, about 30 years ago, I think it is now, they exhumed his body. And they discovered that his frontal lobes had been wiped out. The frontal lobes are key to making moral decisions. Not the only thing required, but they're known to be key. And the youngest part of the brain. So basically, his functionality was really effective. Michael May, another interesting story. We learn sometimes more about the brain by the problems than the real science of normal people. Michael May, at the age of about a month, lost his eyesight due to an explosion. And at age 45, the doctors felt that he had they had a uh, surgical procedure they could restore his sight. Well, restoring sight medically is very rare. It's very unusual. And this was an unusual case. And when they unwrapped the bandages, they had his wife and his two children in front of him, whom he had never seen before. And they were all excited. And uh, they unwrapped the bandages. And he was elated with the bombardment of this 
his sensory perception, uh, and by the way, sight is uh, the biggest portion of the brain is dedicated to the five senses. The biggest proportion is, de uh, is dedicated to sight. And he was just elated. Now, they were keeping a close eye in this case because it was very unusual uh, to be able to restore sight. And it reminds me of a homily I did on sight and insight. When Jesus restores sight. This is really a good example of sight and insight. The only problem is, the next day he couldn't remember his wife's face. He couldn't tell the difference between the trees and the forest. He had no depth perception. If a ball was flying at him, he couldn't tell whether it was a ball or a sphere. I mean, a ball or a, uh, a rectangle. He had some serious problems. What happened? We talked about the conscious and unconscious. What happens is when we're young, we're storing paradigms in our unconscious because the unconscious is 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 very fast and we don't need to think about it so much so what happens is as you're growing as a young child uh, you you don't have to examine your mother's face you see a mole on the side and unconsciously you know that's your mother you don't need, we don't even think about what my mother looks like I know who she is you know uh, and so Basically, with time, he was able to uh, improve and store his own paradigms in his unconscious, unconsciously, to make room in the conscious brain to make the slower, more important decisions. Those decisions became very simple. So we've learned a lot about the brain here in just these two cases. So the unconscious and the conscious. The, the unconscious is very fast, automatic, implicit, Horistic, intuitive, reactive, impulsive, limbic system, that's the old part of the brain, it's the oldest. And uh, conscious is slow, systematic, explicit, analytic, rule based, proactive, reflective, neocortex, the youngest part of the brain. This is where we make our moral decisions. This is where habitual sin gets stored. This is where habitual, uh, not just. Uh, uh, it, Grace gets stored in here. Okay, good virtues are stored in here too. So that's why habitual sin is really tough because it's in, it's buried in the unconscious. So what's in the unconscious? Well, I mentioned a few. Uh, obviously, uh, the the good things are in the unconscious. We have virtues that we become habitual at, but all of the prejudicial isms are in there too. And uh, I threw in, I invented the word religionism because some people are anti one religion or another, and that's that's a form of prejudice. Okay, so uh, the uh, it, the question is then, what is this deal with consciousness and conscience? Now, the duality of the brain forces us to have a, a to use a free will because we have to have some freedom to make decisions between the conflicts. Well. Strangely enough, the Greeks had only one word, synthesis, for consciousness and conscience. Now these are pretty major different things, and yet they only had one word. So consciousness was the, is the external self-awareness. So if I look out there and I tell you that's a tree out there, and there is no tree, well that's pretty erroneous, because there is a tree. So you, you want to, obviously, true consciousness is important. And the conscience, uh, they're sincere and insincere. So I can say something's morally right by rationalizing it is not sincere. But ironically, the Greeks weren't the only one. All of the uh, uh, Romance languages, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, have only one word for both of these. So in English, we're fortunate to have two. I don't know about Vietnamese, but they're unfortunate that we have two. Now the question becomes one of what is moral culpability in the eyes of God? Now this is Aquinas, but it's consistent with what we learned from uh, Michael May and what we learned from Phineas Gage. Basically, an act of omission is morally wrong, and we learn that through our informed conscience, with the operative word being informed. In other words, we educate ourselves, and we do all of that judgment in the conscious brain. Now, we also make it morally culpable in guys of God. We also have to have full knowledge and full freedom. But only God can make those judgments. 
So those people that were condemning Phineas Gage were wrong. And I don't know of another religion. You've done a lot of interfaith work, Father. I have too. I don't know of another religion that makes this distinction between it, uh, objective and subjective sin. In other words, objectively it's a morally wrong. I keep saying morally wrong rather than sinful because our English even confuses the issue. But that's we can objectively say it's morally wrong, but we can't say the guy or gal committed a sin. If you see somebody shooting somebody, I'm telling you, every other Christian denomination I've talked to, I've talked to a lot of them, and I'm not sure about Episcopal. They, they, they may have a little of this. I'm not sure. But uh, the, the, the Baptists, everybody I've talked to basically says, well, then that guy committed a sin in the eyes of God. Well, hold it. What about letting God make the decision? I mean, it's just unbelievable. So Phineas Gage, obviously, in my mind, didn't have full knowledge or full freedom, nor did Michael Bay. But they... They were, and Phineas Gage was a major accident. I mean, it was pretty obvious. The problem with science is it doesn't know the brain that well, so there could be a minor chemical wrong, making somebody bipolar or whatever, and then we have to react the way Mother Teresa acted when she had the man in the streets and she brought him in and cleaned up his wounds, he even magnets all over him. She was cursing him the whole way. And the other nun said to her, Sister, how can you do this? How can you do that when he's cursing you? And she said, well, Jesus was just having a bad day. Now, I'm not suggesting that's good theology, but the point is, the real part of that theology that's solid is that she was treating the God within him. She was not judging his actions because only God can do that. We have to know fully of the, uh, the, the, what's going on in the unconscious level of the person. So that's why the church said we should never jump to conclusion and make an adjustment of any one behavior. We can see the act. The act is unacceptable, it's moral, it's wrong. But do we see that it has no knowledge of that, it has no intention and the freedom of that? When we are all situated in the context of sin, uh, the sins of our family of origin, and, uh, and, and you know, there's many things that really limit our freedom and our intention uh, because we there's so many unconsciously working on our own consciousness and the person is not really free totally. So in some way we say that God doesn't make uh, unfair judgment of anyone. I mean, God is full of mercy even though he may know everything about us. But he know that we are very much conditioned by our own context, uh, by our own circumstances, by our own background, uh, by our own unconscious factors. So actually, the more you understand this kind of uh, psycho, uh, science, scientific discovery, the more you discover that God is really, it's revealed a lot of things. That's why God is so merciful. God is so unconditionally loving for us because he see all of the complexities of our brain and, and it's the at the unconscious level we are being victimized already before we were born, you know. I mean, it's what's happened in your mother's life and then what happened in your uh, your father's life and the, and the family of origin of the father, of the mother and they come together and there's so many things that really uh, become the variables that's affecting how you are now. You become who you are because of a lot of things. You really have no choices, you know. You don't have a choice to be born in that family. And so that's why you are conditioned by a lot of facts. And that's why we okay, so today I'm part of the facts of yeah. our life. But even that facts, there's some of the facts are distorted, some facts are truthful. Yeah. In our secular world, there is no distinction. So in our secular world, we're being asked of when Pope, the Pope said, I'm not going to judge that person. Remember how the secular world interpreted that? They said, well, he's not going to call that a sin. Well, that person sinned. You know, 
they started to launch him. He, he was making the distinction that he was not going to play God yeah. in the moral culpability. In all of the discovery of science, scientific discoveries, and he's really had a, a very good understanding of the theology and science and all of the things about what we are discovering now. And so he, he makes a lot of statements which is really a very humble acknowledging that human understanding and knowledge is so limited. How dare we make judgment whether that person is really committed models in or not? So actually, Pope Francis is really for me one of the most uh, integrated. I, I said many times, Pope Francis has the brain of Pope Paul VI. He has the courage, the guts of John Paul II. He has the compassion of Paul, John Paul, John XXIII. You know, I mean, he really integrate the best of those three popes together in him. So you, you need to really listen to him because he really <coughs> embodied that mercy of God for us. Now, I don't, as far as I don't want to give any particular examples, but in our society today, uh, if, if I say that I, I think something that's being that's done is morally wrong, they will say, well, you are being sexist or racist. You put labels on it, you know, that you're judging a person. Well, I'm never going to culpably uh, condemn an individual for moral culpability. Oh, that's God's deal. But that doesn't mean that I have to agree with their actions. Yeah, we can say and that's a key difference, and they, they will not make that distinction. They'll, they'll hold you to prejudice otherwise. And we, we can say the act is morally wrong. You cannot make a judgment of the person. You say that person is really uh, morally evil. Okay, that's a judgment on the person. And it's, but it's hard to deal with people in that level because you don't want to go there because they won't get this. Yeah, we try to, explain we, we try to narrow, nail you down and say that you are not really understand the, the just teachings. Yeah. Okay. And one question. How about, about this one you said about confession? Oh, uh, what? Confession. Confession? Yeah. What we we uh, over here like we can condemn the other person. When we go confession, we condemn ourselves, right? You are not condemning ourselves, you acknowledge your sins. Yeah. You name your sins. Uh, don't use the word condemning, we are not condemning ourselves. We are admitting that uh, we are sinful. Okay? And then as much as we know about our own intentionality, of our own freedom of choice, uh, and we acknowledge that we know that that act we committed, we did, hurting these people, we're hurting ourselves. Uh, so we, in front of the precept, admitting our sinful nature, and we ask God for forgiveness. Uh, and God, for having His mercy, already forgiving us. What we are confessing in the confession group is to reconcile ourselves with ourselves and with others and with God, and then we ask for the graces of God to help us to reform ourselves, to be converted, to turn around and try to change our lives, okay? Don't you the word condemning. I think condemning is so no, you strong. You, you well, I let my wife was boy poet, okay? And she would uh, get upset with herself and condemn herself because she did something wrong before. Well. When she was doing that long before, she was, I, I knew she didn't have full knowledge or full freedom. So basically, I let God do the condemning. I let God do the condemning of others, and I try to let God do the condemning of me. You think so, God will do the condemning? No. No, no. no. When I say, uh, he's going to make the judgment. Yeah, that's Okay, right. in my wife's case, I have no fear that he would, he would say that you were not culpable. But my point is that God is, we have to let God be God. We so, want to be God ourselves. That, that's the point. Them. So even in confessional room, you confess your sin, you do your part. But you be honest and truthful, but you let God be God. Don't try to play the role of God. Now, collective synthesis does exist. It's collective consciousness is really medicine, or science, etc. They have a certain a sense together that something is 
what, what to do, etc. And then the collective conscience exists really in religion and the state laws, etc. And so all of these things got to be taken into account when we inform our conscience. And uh, these are not in order of priority, but all of these things, and they're not necessarily the total list, have to be considered in our conscious mind in order to make a decision about okay. what's morally right and wrong. Uh, now, uh, you are at Gathicus, okay? When you look at that, you are teaching uh, the, the children or oh, oh, whoever coming to your class uh, the catechetical uh, teachings of the church. You need to understand you have to give them authentic religious teachings. Authentic, mm -hmm. huh? It's not distorted perception, huh? You cannot just use your black and white moral teaching. If you are doing that, you are condemned to hell. You cannot do that. You have to give them, to, uh, help them to understand that there is the uh, there is a moral uh, regulation, moral standards, and the authentic religious teachings. Yeah? And you need to tell the story of the church and the story of Christ, and help them to encounter Christ and love Christ and love Christ, not simply fear. Uh, a, fear, a fear committing sin, but uh, because you get, when you commit a sin, you go to hell. You not go to church on Sunday, you go to hell. And that is just you want to scare people from not going to church. But you need to teach them how to love God and, and love these values, the value that Jesus embody in his life, the values of compassion, caring for the poor, the outcast, the emotional life, uh, the. the the values of you know of, 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 of self emptying, of giving oneself, like sacrifice, serving people, and then you need to really get a very good understanding of sacred scripture and these uh, and the natural law, civil law. So you need to be well informed in order to confirm uh, the conscience of the student that who are coming into your class, and you need to do basically become a spiritual. Uh, guy, or I don't want you to advise this, but guy can help the kids in your class when they have some a crisis in their life. You can you help them to discern really questions for them, make them become aware of God and aware of the church, the church teaches so that they can make discern, uh, making decisions for their life. And you know, you need to present uh, scientific studies. You know, you today we try to give you that book, a book, a book, a book, a book uh, and I try to give you a, a very clear and objective uh, understanding of, of scientific discoveries and how this science related to our, to our church, to the to theology, to the teaching, and a lot of things. That we need to really have an open mind and learn all the time and see that God is using all of these things to do what? To inform us, to make us become more, become freer. Become more alive, become fuller as a human person. You know, if you teach something, you make people become 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 uh, slaves. It's like you know, all of the uh, what is it, fundamentalist uh, roots, you know, whether Islamic or, or whether whatever religion, they're trying to tell you that you have to do this, and you kill many people, and you will go to heaven. And when you have, you have saw all of the the, the, the sexual kind of uh, uh, fulfillment. You know, all the things are distorted. Uh, you you brainwash people and do something wrong. So uh, inform counsel doesn't mean you make a person become alive, become basically mature, can make decisions, can discern what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is better, and what is the best. Okay, and that's important. Now, by the way, this is especially, I especially use this for bioethics, because there the decisions can get really complicated. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm a benevolent God. Frontal lobes, stop judging if you may not be judged. Unconscious brain, stop judging you will not be judged. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgiven, you will not be forgiven. Um, now, there are research conferences that have covered various subjects, and I've given presentations in all of these. Uh, the first is secular, dualistic, and uh, I, uh, at the Mind and Life Conference, uh, uh, Thomas Keating, Rabbi Smug, asked me to represent him there, and it was mainly Buddhist, and uh, we, uh, we presented various things. Then at the Brain, Death, and Desires of Consciousness, uh, that was uh, where there were problems with brains, and, and we learned a little bit about the brain, we find out what the problems are. 
But the two really religious ones are the Conference on Medicine and Religion, which is co-sponsored by Harvard University of Chicago and the Institute for Spirituality and Health, of which I'm, I'm connected. And uh, he was in Houston two years in a row, and we'll talk about that. And then the, its, its counterpart in Europe is European Conference on Religion, Spirituality, and Health, mostly European universities. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of cross-fertilization, which is, is sad, but that's what should be done. Now, in terms of the, the Bible on religion and health, uh, this is the uh, editor of the Handbook of Religion and Health, and it's a compendium of research on uh, various things about religion. Not much on spirituality, because spirituality is hard to quantify, uh, whereas religion can quantify a little bit more. So the research, the research in that book is really in three areas. One is if you have a faith belief, uh, you have a better sense of well-being. And this is just one study. There's actually a whole slew of studies. Uh, the limbic system, the, uh, the immune system, uh, the heart rates, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the other is if you attend church regularly, and this is irrespective of the faith that was any church, uh, you can live up to seven years longer. The other is prayer practice. Uh, I was involved in this particular research, and it was uh, discursive prayer, and it was basically reducing the, the amount of uh, depression. So religious involvement can have effects all the way down the line. Uh, reduced uh, Union or Lucan, uh, which it shows that the immune system is, is, is strong, well being, happiness, life, and satisfaction, lower rates of suicide. All of, there are thousands of studies in this book that describe all of this, and it's very powerful. Uh, Koenig is a uh, uh, professor at Duke, a Catholic, by the way. Now, fertility rates. Um, I found this interesting. Uh, we're talking about this under the concept of uh, uh, biology and consciousness because now that we're conscious of the outside world, we start looking at studies, etc. The fertility rate is the rate at which, uh, uh, at which a number, the number of children per woman is born. <coughs> now, uh, to maintain a culture, you need a minimum of 1.9, of 2.1 here. Uh, no culture survived at 1.9 or less. And uh, this is, I think this is actually a little bit lower than this. It's changed since I did this. But the Islamic rate is 8.1. So with immigration in the U.S., we're at 2.1, we're okay. Without immigration, we're at about 1.6 in the U.S. France, 1.8. Italy, where a lot of Catholics are located, 1.2. Spain, 1.1. What does this mean? This means that a culture of death where you have abortion, birth control, and capital punishment, that that culture will not survive. So that thinking pattern will die out. Uh, God, the, heal, the divine healer has a way of self-regulating us. I mean, it, this isn't going to last because those people that believe in that don't have offspring. They're gone. So uh, that's something a lot of times we're not aware of. Now, I've done marriage counseling, marriage prep with people, and um, if I get a couple that says, well, we want to live together, and that's happening more and more, uh, I, I don't care to get to that real quick, but what they do is they say, well, why are we here? I say, well, here, I'm here to help you along the marriage. That's my purpose. If you accept that, then we'll work together. They always do. And then I find out that they're living together. And instead of preaching to them, I have found a more effective approach. Especially if they're secularized and they're only there because mom told them to be there. I mean, you know, uh, I'll say, well, if you live together, there's a 40% chance, greater chance you're not going to get married. Uh, you're a 50% greater divorce rate in the U.S. if you cohabitate. In Europe, it's 80%. Uh, there's a greater divorce, 60% greater divorce rate in non virgin bride. 47% male infidelity is cohabitating. Greater, the, the statistics are not good. Uh, the less educated usually are doing it. Uh, uh, there's usually part of the, the, less, the less educated tend to do it more than the very educated. You can look these up. Then, after I get their attention, I say, now, that just happens to be Catholic teaching. 
I wonder why science and Catholicism are on the same page. And then they will start, they may start talking, but then it's back to the original question, why did you want me here? To help you have a long marriage or not? You, gotta, you, you have to decide, basically. Uh, now, prayer and meditation, which is a word that's been kind of absconded with in our public society, but meditation in our society now applies to all types of meditation, right? all types of prayer, whatever. Uh, it really comes from the Latin meditatio, which means to think. So, uh, studies done by Herbert Benson of Harvard uh, show a tremendous difference in, uh, in, in it's tremendous improvements. Increased metabolism, increased heart rate, increased rate of breathing, slower brain wave, reduced pain, etc. Okay. Pain management, prayer is the second highest use of, uh, of prayer, of dealing with pain, next to pain bills. Now, the University of Consciousness, now you didn't hear the program this morning, but I give you a little taste of it. And basically, consciousness and the universe are connected somehow. And I'll show you. He, Roger Penrose is the guy that Stephen Hawking went to to get math help because uh, Stephen Hawking didn't have the math capability. And Roger Penrose helped him. Roger is at Cambridge. Um, Consciousness seems to me to be such an important phenomenon that I simply cannot believe that it's something just accidentally conjured up by a complicated computation. It is the ph phenomenon whereby the universe's very existence is made known. One can argue that a universe governed by laws that do not allow consciousness is no universe at all. Rather interesting. He's 87 years old now, this is younger. I, read it, I met him in Switzerland. And he is looking at a attended presentation by him, and he's looking at explaining consciousness at a quantum level. So this shows you how science is really on, on the cutting edge of trying to decide what this is about. Consciousness evolution, Father Teilhard de Chardin, who believed that evolution wasn't just biological, but it was also spiritual. The most telling and profound way of describing the evolution of the universe would undoubtedly be to trace the evolution of love. There is almost a sensual longing for community with others have a large vision. The immense fulfillment of the friendship between those engaged in furthering the evolution of consciousness has a quality impossible to describe. Now, all of this sounds like there's a problem, a major problem. Science did some studies, and what they're always doing studies. Science did some studies, and what they did is they interviewed a set of uh, subjects, and they took took down what their preferences were. Uh, what was your political party preference? What's your religion preference? What's your uh, race preference, culture preference, financial preference, whatever. A whole bunch of different categories. Then they gave a, a set of multiple choice questions or, or statements saying that research shows that uh, if you picked Catholicism, Research shows that Catholicism is the best religion. Or if you said, well, I'm a Democrat, research shows that the Democrats are much more powerful than whatever. Okay, so then they said people, when they went through, they confirmed their own bias by picking only those data that represented what they already said they were. That's not surprising. We go in with a certain bias, and now we're looking for information to support it. We ignore the other. The question is, it's really a rationalization. It's automatic. It's not deliberate deception. It's cognitive evidence conferring beliefs. Irrational primacy effect. It's illusory correlation. It's not real. But the problem is that Let us, one among you, so that I sin, the first throw the stone, everything goes into a person from outside and defiles. But what comes out of a person, that's what defiles from within people from their hearts, from evil thoughts. All these evil thoughts come from within and they defile. I brought this slide up a step too early. What I meant to say first was that within the unconscious are these biases and also our virtues. Interesting. Our habitual sins are the unconscious, our biases, uh, our, our, our virtues that we've been practiced with. The question is, how do we flush that 
confirmation bias out into the conscious brain so that we can deal with it. Okay? Um, and I'll tell a story I told this morning. I, I do some prison ministry and uh, up in Palestine, Texas, and uh, maximum security prison. And uh, this black uh, man came up to me, and they don't feel comfortable talking personal stuff inside the prison because they can get killed. But he trusted me. I was the deacon. I was from outside, etc. He said, "I don't know what to do. I am fearful of white policemen." And I said, and, and he said, "I know it's wrong." And I said, but that doesn't make you a racist. I want you to know that. Now, you've heard that term thrown around in the public door a lot, right? But that doesn't make you a racist. And the reason is, you had something happen to you in the past, did you? And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, so what I said is your, your brain is trying to protect you from that happening again. So it's put that into the unconscious. The challenge is to bring it out. Now, to drive the whole the point more, even more emotionally, I said, a white woman says, I'm afraid of black men because, and does that make her prejudice? If something happened to her before, and her brain is putting in the unconscious to try to protect herself from the future, that means she's not a racist. But both of you have the same problem. How are you going to get that out of the unconscious into the conscious brain because it's not right? You, we, both, we all know it's not right, but I'm not going to condemn you for it. I'm going to try to look for a way, we've got to cook to a way together to see how we can unload the unconscious into the conscious brain. So this is a very important ministry in the church. Uh, when we are in counseling or in spiritual directions, so we have to build up the relationship with the person who comes to us for help. Uh, and a lot of things we call uh, confirmation bias in our unconscious because this happened to us, it's traumatic, it's painful, and then sometimes it's uh, caught the wounds, uh, distortion in our perception, uh, uh, blockage in our own understanding. And then sometimes uh, we want to, as, uh, I mean, our own unconscious, unconsciousness for the sake of survival, we suppress that into the much deeper level of unconsciousness, and sometimes we forget of all of the stories about it. But we know that we have reaction against certain people uh, because if the unconscious having us, we have to protect ourselves, and those become confirmed as being a bias. And so, uh, and then sometimes it's, it, when we meet, meet someone who loves us enough, we can trust enough that we can just uh, just uh, settle down and. And, and, and remove all our defensive mechanisms and we let them out. And these experiences, these painful acts of magic spring will come out. And then we will remember what's happened in the past. And that remember come along with the healing. That healing helps us to be free from that. And then that's when the bias becomes uh, removed. It's, it's not to be a confirmed bias anymore. It's become uh, a, an experience in our life that enrich our life. It's make us become more compassionate to other people when they are going through that, and we can share with their uh, uh, their their pains, and later on we can help them to release from that bondage. This is really a, a process of moving the stuff. The bias from the unconsciousness to the consciousness, and it takes a lot of trust, a lot of love. So, in order for us to serve the people who are going through a lot of pain, traumatic, just like sexual abuse, you know, you need really to allow them to go through a lot of process of projecting, scapegoating, and, and sometimes using you to bore, to vent all of the anger on you. And you, know, you, 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 you take all of these things, you just wish to understand that you love them enough that you allow them to empty all of the trashes on you. You become what? The trash box, the garbage can. And then you help them to recycle what's going on in their life. And that is love. Jesus knew that. When he was on the cross, he became what? The scapegoat. Huh? We dumped on him all of the things, all the hurts, all these biases, all of these kind of evil intentions on him. And then he just used his love to transform all these poisonous uh, kind of uh, uh, things that we inflict on him 
bodily, emotionally, and spiritually, and then he turned that into the medicine of life. So you see, that's what happened in the pastoral mystery of the church. And, and that's a normal reaction of the brain. It's actually trying to protect itself. Yeah. So how do we how do we unload that confirmation bias from the unconscious to the conscious? That leads us leads us logically into mysticism. And prayer. There are two types of prayer. Discursive in the Greek cataphatic example of meditation, which is our guided meditation. That's where you're engaging the imagination. Meditatio in the definition as we as Catholics would use. Uh, other the, the secular world uses the term meditation to cover both of these, but that's not true. Contemplation is the other, contemplative, apophatic, and an example of setting the contemporary prayer. Now, what's interesting is these uh, two categories are shared by all theistic faiths. All of them have both of those categories. Centering prayer facilitates contemplative or mystical prayer. Okay. So the question is, is this mysticism, uh, how real is this? Well, what do the important people have to say? Thomas Berkman, Trappist Monk. Our contemplation of him, God, is a participation in his contemplation of himself. Wow. The most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mystical. Albert Einstein. But you didn't expect that one. So, what is this stuff that they're talking about? Well, the omnibenevolent God, mystical experiences. I love the first quote, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. More delightful is your love than wine. The first line of the Song of Solomon is talking about a mystical experience, and most people have not experienced this. You almost have to experience it to understand what it's being said. And in terms of prayer, Matthew 6, 6, when Jesus was asked, by the way, how do you pray? He didn't say they are Father first. He said, when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, pray to your Heavenly Father in secret, and he will hear you in secret. Do not be like the pagans who use many words. Whoa, that sounds like me for many my, for, for part of my life. Telling God what I needed, when I needed, how I needed. I didn't need God. I had given him full instructions. He didn't need me. I didn't need him. I told him exactly what I needed to do. The consciousness evolution, he went about doing good and healing others. For everything he was doing good, it's nothing he's free to reject, etc. So, prayer definitions. Centering prayer is a method to facilitate contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is the opening our whole being to God. It is what God does. The first one is what we do. The other, the second, is what God does or doesn't do. We're not going to tell him what to do. Now, the desert fathers and mothers in Egypt went in in the fourth century, went into the desert of Egypt to try to understand what Jesus was telling uh, them to do, and in the writings. And uh, what they they had a uh, an author that followed Saint Cassian. He wrote the conferences, 425 A.D. This is the longest work in Christian antiquity. I'll bet you haven't heard of it before. And it was the main reference that Benedict used for the rule of Benedict, for the monks and nuns ever since. The mind rejects the whole wealth and abundance of thoughts, the soul then pours out to God wordless prayers. Interesting. Something like what Jesus said. What are they getting at? Keep that in your head. Uh, that's also related to what Dickens uh, Pope just said about the affirming uh, bias. And the past sometimes are the biases. Yeah. And when you let go of these biases, then you begin to be empty, to be free, so you can see where, who you are, and your inner being. That's right. So these are key guidelines on how to practice this prayer. You take a sacred symbol, usually if you're a beginner or word, and it's an intention to be with God. So it only has to have meaning to you. It's going to be one or two syllables. And I've got a handout about this prayer uh, that I want to give to you. It kind of summarizes this. Then you sit in a comfortable position. You don't have to make it a lotus position. At least I can give up if I do that. Uh, and you introduce the symbol of God's presence. And as thoughts come, 
And when you become aware of your thoughts, or when you, this is the key line, this is the most important line in the whole presentation. This is key. Thoughts in return. We all have thoughts. We're human. Okay. So when we become aware or engaged in our thoughts, thoughts, then gently, ever so gently, let them go and return to your sacred word. And then at the end of 20 minutes, you general, have a gentle readjustment and conclude in silence in a couple of minutes. And then we usually say, Our Father, not together, but in our minds, very slowly, Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, we follow the advice of Matthew 6 6 after we went to our inner room. So, uh, we might do that if we have time. I think we do. What kind of thoughts will come? Well, because we're human, we are going to have thoughts. Now, these thoughts are in the conscious brain. As we gently let them go, what's happening? We're letting more room in the conscious brain for the unconscious brain to unload. How are we going to get out of confirmation bias? This is the answer. Okay? Ordinary imagination. Then turn off the automobile lights. Attractions and aversions. That person really makes me angry. Insights and enlightenments. Now I understand the Trinity better. By the way, we make no judgments about thoughts. We treat all thoughts the same. We ever so gently let them go and return to our sacred work. We're not we're not worried about remembering that third month. I guarantee you, you'll remember it. But you're going to make no judgment about the thoughts. You let them all go. In perspective reflections, I'm not doing so well at this every prayer. Or I picked the wrong word. Don't change words, because that's a thought. <laughs> you ever so gently let it go, return to your sacred word. And then there are thoughts that would be unloading of the unconscious, which is what we were kind of looking for here. But you can't look for thoughts while you're doing this. But I know from experience that can happen. I know I'll remember the hurt from my childhood. So let me give you some examples of experience in teaching this to thousands, which leads to the research that I reported on in Switzerland. I taught it to, I think it was about 10 people. Three months later, I ran into a man I didn't know him other than that presentation, and I said, how's it going? He said, well, not too well. I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I had a problem with prayer, and I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I suddenly became aware of what really happened to me in Vietnam. And I, I didn't go into detail, but it was clearly PTSD. I said, what did you do then? And he said, I ever so gently let it go and return to God. Wow, the divine healing is healing you. That was buried in the unconscious for a reason. He wasn't ready to deal with it in his conscious brain. But his practice of this prayer now gave him the ability to deal with it because God now knew that he could let it go when he gave it to him. I told that to the head of the psychiatric department of Baylor. His eyes popped out. He said, we don't know how to treat PTSD. I said, you do now, but God said divine healer. So I put a proposal together for the VA hospital. They have floors of these people. Uh, another example, well, I'll get to another example which leads into the research. Physical effects, lower blood pressure, less melancholy, less suffering. Most people report these. Uh, and uh, less sleep means not that you can't sleep, but it means you need less sleep. Spiritual effects are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Most commonly, peace is the most common one. Psychological effects. Now, if you were at Father's talk earlier, you, this will resonate a little bit. Psychological effects switch from false self, in other words, dependent on the energy centers of esteem. In other words, you're trying to get acceptance, you're drinking alcohol, drugs, you're seeking money. Power, control, anger, hurt and security, future work prioritizations, workaholic, and they switch to the true self, union with the indwelling God. That's why it's called centering prayer. And by the way, all the Abrahamic faiths believe in an indwelling God. 
So I've taught this practice interfaith. It's astounding because in the silence there's no dog. Centering of vehicle to contemplation, contemplation gives God of God's action, union, divine thought, or kiss. In a kiss, you can't speak. You wouldn't want to speak, you wouldn't be able to. But that's what we're seeking from God is the divine kiss in the Song of Solomon. Now, there have been brain scans of sat Franciscan nuns doing sacred prayer by this man, Newberg. Uh, this is a rather old study, and neuroplasticity shows that their brains did change. So it's, it's actually physically affecting us, and why shouldn't it? Because of all the healings Jesus did in Scripture, every one of them was both spiritual and physical, because we're not dualistic. Right? The question then is, Transcendent consciousness. I taught this prayer to 10 people one time. And at the end of their first 20 minutes set, they said, three of them started to have their eyes pop out and they started to talk to me about having relived a near death experience they had had in the previous part of their life during that first 20 minutes set. And they talked to, talk to each other. Every one of them had the same thing. 98% of people have pleasurable near death experience. Uh, that was a categorized in my head. I put that away, stored it. I thought, boy, I was a fly on the wall. I had never seen that before. Uh, then I, uh, uh, then I, let see here, I'm gonna be sure. Uh, yeah, then I uh, went to Cuba to, to present faith and science actually uh, spirituality and healing at the conference on uh, that I mentioned, one of the, sec the, the second conference, which was uh, Disorders of Consciousness. And it was the first time religion had been taught in public university in Cuba since the revolution. So I put a team together, we went down. The man I met there who let us have a whole day out of his international conference, turns out he's one of the world's experts in bringing people out of coma. And I said to him, suddenly it dawned on me, well, let me back up again. During the conference, he said, why don't you teach centering prayer? And I, in a loving, deep way, I said, are you totally out of your mind? I mean, this is an atheist school. What are you talking about? He said, no. Why don't you do it? I said, okay. His daughter was also an MD neuroscientist, and she invited all her neuroscience friends. And in Cuba, it's probably 85% Catholic, mostly um, uh, Buried in it. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's practice, but they're quiet about it. Okay? It's this underground church in like China. Um, and in her first 20 minutes set, um, I, in fact, back to the story, this is worth it. I'm thinking it's in English, it's, the whole conference is in English because it's international. But I thought teaching this is critical because I want it in their language. And words are, some of the words are important. Then I remember that the head of the Trappist organization that was set up internationally called Contemplative Outreach, the, the, the former chairman was a priest in Havana. I called him, I said, can you come over and teach it in Spanish? He said, sure. So I gave the science in English, she, they taught it in Spanish. All the neuroscientists are sitting there, you know, doing this. I don't know if they're atheists or not, if they were, I have no idea what they were doing, but we explained it. He explained it. At the end of the 20 minutes set, the daughter who organized it had a profound mystical experience. She had a complete out of body experience. It's pretty rare, less than 5%. Well, actually, partial, maybe less than 5%, even more rare as total, as near death experiences are rare. And she started explaining to her neuroscience friends their eyes were popping out. If I had explained that, they would have ignored me. But here, this was her, their fellow neuroscientists, and they never heard talk this way. Then it dawned on me to ask the question. Later, I go to Kelly Stovachado, the guy who said, do this on this conference, and I'll give you a whole day. Even went to the Cardinal, and he co sponsored it, and was there at the old. This was profound. This was in 2015. Um, Getting into Cuba is not a problem. 
getting out might have been a problem, but I, you know, whatever, I did it. So anyway, uh, I said to Calixto, I said, well, you are one of the world's experts in bringing people out of coma. Tell me, have you had many people tell you about near death experiences? And he said, oh, all the time. And the scientist in me starts climbing across the table. And I said, you mean you've got brain scans in this people? <laughs> this is what I've been searching for. He said, well, I don't know if it was when they had the experience. So, bottom line, we established a research project, and he said, we get them to remember their experiences. That's just as bad. Now, he's a neuroscientist. I, can, I assume that that was because uh, PTSD is, is critical, too. I mean, people can remember their experience so vividly that they're launched back in time. So, that's what we did. And in the discussion of what this was about, we learned that near-death experiences are the ones on the left, and mystical experiences are SCD. We call it spiritual contemplative experiences. And this is part of the presentation I did in Switzerland. There are four attributes that are shared by both of them, and I'm calling it transcendent, because this is a transcendent consciousness level between this life and the next. Paranormal out-of-body. People who have near-death experiences talk about looking down at their own body. Spaceless ecstasy, people that have spiritual, mystical experiences, and I mean profound experiences, uh, will float above in, in their own minds. But St. Paul had that experience. He was taken up with Adam. Yeah. You, you read the letter that he wrote. Yeah. Now, they don't look back on their body. Well, I'm not surprised because they didn't die. But they're looking down at others. Second attribute, cognitive timelessness. Uh, in both cases, it feels like five minutes, but they've been doing this for an hour or whatever. Effective peace, a sense of peace, and a sense of wholeness and perfection which gives that peace. And a transcendent divine spiritual experience. So they experience God or angels or something like that. And a oneness with the universe, regardless of belief. So I noticed those four attributes being similar. I had now a guy that could identify these people, because I had no access to those subjects. And Father Walker, who teaches it in Havana, knows people that have done this. Because people don't want to talk about it. So only a spiritual director could do that. And, uh, and then, of course, get their permission to have them participate. The next was to pick a tool. How are we going to study their brain? We want spatial measurement, solid, and temporal. In other words, we want to fit certain things of these things you've seen, I'm sure, in medicine. Some are very good at telling you where in the brain things happen, and others are very good at the speed with which they happen. Uh, Calixto quickly realized that both of these are very fast, and he wanted to get something that would do the best. So he picked this. That's quantitative EEG tomography. The preliminary conclusion significant acute EEGT correlations across broad frequency ranges between remembering NDE and SCE. This is consistent with the common Grayson scale attributes of both. Grayson scale was invented for NDE, but it includes those four attributes, so we applied it to both. And uh, most frequencies were higher for SC, consistent with the fact that subjects are not dying. And I won't go through all of these, but basically these different frequency ranges, cognitive, concentrative, memory, attentiveness, were all matching. <laughs> there are limitations, you don't know for sure if it's the same as the actual experience. And we had uh, five uh, we had five subjects in each category, so that limit that reduces the statistical significance of the scientist speaking. So I presented this in, uh, in Switzerland about six weeks ago, five weeks ago. And I wasn't the first to notice this. And he was written by Mr. Dr. Moody, describing these attributes in '75, and the Grayson scale confirms it. And William James, 
describe mystical experiences and a variety of religious experiences back as far back in 1902. But the problem with both of those guys is that science had not really recognized it. They thought this was airy fairy. And it's hard to objectively study it because these are subjective experiences. So they would question the people who would describe them. Not, not so anymore. This conference, and there were about 300 there a few weeks ago, uh, profound. Penrose given a presentation on quantum effects and how that could be consciousness. Uh, a lot of, a lot of amazing talks. But transcendental events is what should be of interest to us because this is the transcendence between this world and the next. Isn't there a third one? And based on the discussion of the universe, probably not in the review I gave you but this morning, <coughs> you may guess what the third one is. The singularity at the beginning of the Big Bang. That's between this world and that. In the creation. Uh, spaceless? Well, there's no material in, in the singularity, so it's dimensionless. There's, there is no space. Timeless? There's no light. There's no time. Peace? Perfection? Uh, well, it's perfect. Uh, anybody here familiar with entropy? Entropy is a measure of this disorder of the universe. Second law of thermodynamics said entropy always increases. But at the singularity, entropy was zero. It was perfectly ordered. Transcendent divine religious oneness, universal. Well, Einstein's unified equation said four forces are unified. So Einstein's theories led to these four. They match. I've not seen this thing put like that anywhere else, but the point is that I believe what Augustine of Hippo said, and that is, let's study nature in more detail to find out what God's telling us. Let's unload that unconscious to get rid of those prejudices and turn our conscious brain over to God and surrender. Now, uh, what does that mean? You talk about universe oneness. You've heard that people sometimes talk about that. Well, in a sense, this is my graphic finale. There's unity in the universe, but this is outside space and time. All three of them. That's for God. I, I gotta tell you this, this wasn't a plan. I'm reading you know, Stephen Hawking's last work, and it was actually a compilation of his writings. Maybe you, you know what I'm talking about. It's big, you know, uh, the small answers to big questions or something like that. And I would, he was an atheist when he died. Of course, everybody says, well, if he was an atheist, he was a genius. You know, don't let that fool you, okay? So I, he put in there his reasoning why he was an atheist. This is what it was. I knew it fell over. Because at the singularity there was no time, there could be no God because God didn't have time to create the universe. God created time. So basically the God that he does not believe in is also the God that I don't believe in. <laughs> he didn't, didn't say anything. But the guy was so steeped in science that I'm not, I don't attack him, but the logic was flawed. There's no question about it. You have to say God has no time. And that That's your outside of time. He has no, he created time. It would be like saying that the person who invented the Volkswagen consigned himself to have to live in that. Yeah. What? Excuse me? So, okay. 